voice of the decade, Sunday Silence and Easy Goer in 1989. Easy Goer with one final acceleration and Sunday Silence holds on! And the emotional moments of last year's distaff. As we witnessed Go for Wand fall in the stretch, images we will retain for a long time. Was in 1988 in the shadow of the twin spires of Churchill Downs in Louisville. We saw Angel Cordero aboard the first two winners, Gulch and Open Mind. We saw the undefeated Philly personal ensign with an impossible finish in the distaff in one of the most exciting races in thoroughbred history. We saw the first successful defense of a Breeders' Cup title when the French Philly Miesque won the mile by four lengths. And we saw Ali Sheba emerge from the darkness to take the classic and horse of the year. This year, the Breeders' Cup returns to Kentucky with a lineup of who's who in thoroughbred racing. America's top sprinter, Alf Buckley, who has fired off three straight wins. Canadian Triple Crown winner, Dan Smartley, set to go on the distaff. Tight Spot, whose perfect turf record will be challenged by the nation's top dirt horse in excess in the mile and the most star-studded classic in Breeders' Cup history, including Kentucky Derby winners Unbridled and Strike the Gold, Preakness winner and Derby runner-up Summer Squall, and top older horse Vestine. The best in the thoroughbred world have set their sights on the Twin Spires. From Churchill Downs, it's the Breeders' Cup. Next. Breeders' Cup Day has dawned cold and windy under the twin spires of Churchill Downs. The horses like it, but for the fans, it's a raw November day. A record cold for a Breeders' Cup Day. The temperature in Louisville and at Churchill Downs, 38 degrees as we approach post time for the first Breeders' Cup race. In a pretty stiff wind blowing as well, about 15 miles an hour, it is cold at the Breeders' Cup this year. Now, extensive rain yesterday. The track was floppy for the Friday afternoon card. It's been drying out, officially listed as good on the main track now. The first race was run in pretty good time, six furlongs in one, ten, and two, so the track is in good condition. The turf course rated firm, although it has to be a bit on the soft side after all the rain of yesterday. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Churchill Downs for Thoroughbred Racing's biggest day, the eighth Breeders' Cup day, and the most competitive, wide-open Breeders' Cup yet. This has been a year when no one horse has emerged to dominate the racing scene, so virtually all the divisional championships are up for grabs, and the events of this day will likely determine Horse of the Year honors. Despite these chilly conditions, a crowd of some 75,000 expected here at the track, with thousands more at simulcast locations around the country. With at least one European entrant in every race, we truly have the best horses, trainers, and jockeys in the world here today. Seven races worth a total of $10 million. And something new this year, the Breeders' Cup National Pick 7. Betters around the country will have a chance to pick all seven Breeders' Cup winners with all the money going into a single pool reaching the millions of dollars. Well, we're rapidly approaching post time for the first Breeders' Cup race, which is the six furlong Breeders' Cup sprint with a purse of a million dollars. The order has just gone to the riders to mount up, and as they head for the racetrack, this race has the most uh, overwhelming favorite of the day. You know, we totaled up that to play all the possible combinations in the pick seven would cost you nearly $30 million, and so you have to make some singles, and this one, Housebuster. Here's the call to the post. And the horses are coming on the track for the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Remember, in the state of Kentucky, the analgesic butazolidin, the anti-bleeding medication Lasix are legal. Number one Polish numbers owned by former Jockey Club chairman Ogden Phipps, whose family has raised one of America's most powerful stables since the 1920s. Phipps and trainer Shug McGahee won the 1989 Sprint with Dancing Spree. Polish Numbers was away from the races for a year, but has come back with two straight wins. 
Number two is the favorite house buster. Missed the Breeders' Cup due to injury a year ago, but still was named champion sprinter. Probably will be again this year. He's won 15 of 21 career races, including his last three. His most recent start, an impressive five-and-a-half length Roth in Belmont's Vossburg. Owner Robert Levy says this will be the champion's final start. He retires to stud at John Abel Farm after today's race. Number three, Take Me Out, was second in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile last year. Coming back from a nine-month layoff with an ankle problem, Take Me Out won the King's Bishop at Saratoga in stakes record time, but has been beaten at a mile his last two starts. Number four, Robin Dancer. His California-based trainer, Daryl Vienna, once won first prize in a writing contest sponsored by the American Academy of Poets and co-wrote a script for the TV show, Hill Street Blues. He hopes this Breeders' Cup script has a happy ending. That would be Robin Dancer in the winner's circle. Number five, Senior Speedy. He lost a housebuster by just a nose in the forego handicap, but has finished behind the champion in all four meetings this year. He'll have a late run today, like he did in his last prep, the Boojum Handicap in New York. Number six, Clever Trevor, named for the son of owner Don McNeil of Edmond, Oklahoma. Clever Trevor is making his sixth start of the year at six different tracks. He's earned $1.3 million, but like all the others, he's been chasing housebuster. Number seven, Pleasant Tap, a Breeders' Cup veteran, sixth in the 1989 Juvenile and eighth in the 1990 Turf. He's been running mostly in longer races, but his best efforts have been at sprint distances. Number eight, Deposit Ticket. If anyone knows a deposit ticket, it's W.T. Young, whose Overbrook Farm owns half interest in this colt. Reputed to be the wealthiest man in Lexington, Kentucky, Young recently donated $5 million to the University of Kentucky to help build a new library. This colt comes off a good win on a muddy track at Keeneland. Number nine, Sheikh Albadu, Europe's lone representative in the sprint, bred by Highclere Stud, owned by Lord Carnivon, the Queen's racing manager. Number 10 is Key Spirits. Key Spirits owner Michael Singh was born in India, now lives in Toronto, where trainer Stephen Barnes is based. They claimed this horse for $32,000 last year, and he has earned over $300,000 since that time. And number 11 is Media Plan, owned by the Oaktown stable of the Burrell family. That includes Stanley Burrell, the rap music artist, Hammer. And if this horse wins, the party won't stop till Monday. Well, we're pleased to have our handicapping expert and the racing expert, Bob Newmeyer, on this year's telecast once again. Bob, give us an overview of this Breeders' Cup Sprint. Hi, Tom Hammond. Thank you very much. You know, past Breeders' Cups uh, had an identity all their own. Believe me, I've been to all of them. But I think the key phrase to think about today is unpredictability. Five of the seven championship races you're about to see are wide open competitive events where you can make an honest to goodness case for six, seven, maybe even eight horses in the field. There's one or two notable exceptions. Coming up in the sprint, you're about to see the amazing House Buster. His last race, he's being held as a prohibitive favorite here at Churchill Downs. For more on House Buster, let's go to our man on the track, our colleague, jockey Greg McCarran. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I'll be paying a lot of attention to the way Craig Perrette's going to warm up House Buster. In the past, Craig's taken him for a good gallop, and then just before he goes in the gate, he jogs him in a tight figure eight about two or three times. The reason for this, because uh, the House Buster, as he first starts off, is a little bit tight in behind, and this should loosen him up to ensure a real good break. House Buster, currently the one to two favorite, the most overwhelming favorite of today's Breeders' Cup races. A classic is favored in the turf. Leewood Park in Los Angeles. You know, California really is known as running the fastest sprint races in the world. It's known as California Speed. But this afternoon, I'm going to go for a horse that doesn't have any speed, even though he's from California, and that's Pleasant Tap. He'll be dead last early, but if the track favors him, Pleasant Tap will be right there at the end. Let's go now to one of our co-hosts, coming back from the last two years here on Breeders' Cup, Jenny Ornstein. Well, the European horses took both of the Breeders' Cup turf races last year. Encouraged by that, they are sending 23 to post this year. They threaten very strongly again in the grass race races. But before you throw out their chances first time on the dirt, remember Ibn Bay, second at 38 to 1 in the Classic, and De Jour, who missed by a shadow last year in the sprint. International event this year, the Breeders' Cup Canadian horses as well. Here's Dan Kenny, who covered them for the CBC Network. Dan? 
Well, Jenny, I think the Canadian horses brought the Canadian air with them, so they should be very comfortable here. I've seen some great Canadian champions, but they've not yet won a Breeders' Cup event. Like the Toronto Blue Jays in baseball, they've come tantalizingly close, but our neighbors to the north want to see if their heroes dance smartly and Sky Classic can get the job done today. The Kentucky Hardboots still need convincing, however, that these two are our for real. We'll also get a look at 17-year-old champion jockey Mickey Walls. They say he's the best out of Canada since Sandy Hawley. He rides key spirit in the sprint. And here are the current odds in the Million Dollar Breeders' Cup Sprint. And House Buster, the prohibitive favorite at 1-2. to two. Pleasant Tap at 8-1 to one at the moment. Everyone else in double figures. Key Spirit that Dan mentioned, a real long shot at 35-1. to one. And Media Plan, the Hammer's Horse, 60-1 to one you can get on Media Plan. And there is House Buster. You know, this horse is interesting. It's his final start. He takes acupuncture treatments for uh, an ailing back always two days before a race. And there is his owner, Robert Levy, chairman of the board of Atlantic City Race Course. Seeing his champion take the track for the final time, he retires to stud after today's race. Greg McCarron, uh, all eyes on House Buster, including yours, I presume, as he uh, warming up as they get ready to go to the post. Tom, he looked terrific. Craig kept jogging him right up to the time we got in the, in the right near the gate here, and he looks absolutely wonderful. There is House Buster, hoping to join this list of past winners. Elo the first, precisionist, smile, very subtle gulch, dancing spree, just beat safely kept. And safely kept, came back after Days Your Jumpers Cup record held by Precisionist and at Churchill Downs, the track record here. House Buster is in the gate. We have a field of 11 dashing six furlongs in the first Breeders' Cup race of the day, the Breeders' Cup Sprint. This will also give us a line on the condition of the racetrack. Officially good, but it was uh, in pretty good shape. One ten and 2 the first six furlong race on the card today. Well, Tom Durkin is back once again to call the Breeders' Cup races. Tom, bring us up to date now as they load for the sprint. The final horse is moving into line now for this eighth Breeders' Cup sprint, and all eyes are focused on post position number two, where calmly stands House Buster, last year's champion sprinter. Another title ahead for him this year as we await the start of the sprint. This is the final start in the brilliant career of House Buster. Canadian Key Spirit moves into line. Media plan, move into the outside post, and then we will be ready for the start of the sprint. And they're off. House Buster comes off a beat slow, and media plan now on the outside, rushes up to get the lead. House Buster on the attack on the inside now, and he's racing second after a bit of a flat-footed start. And then it's deposit ticket in between horses. The California Gray Robin Dancer toward the inside. The Canadian Key Spirit is on the outside, running along in fifth. Sheik Albadu, the European runner, is now about seven lengths from the lead. Clever Trevor is now racing in eighth position. And then it's Polish numbers, followed by Take Me Out by the back. Senior Speedy, Pleasant Tap trails the field. And the first quarter, and they zipped it in 21 seconds flat. And they're all chasing media plan. House Buster is chasing him second now. House Buster now makes his move as they come to the top of the stretch. And here comes Robin Dancer, and he's gearing up too. Sheikh Albadu is fourth on the outside, and House Buster rolls as they turn into the stretch. And Media Plan down on the inside. House Buster with a bold challenge. Media Plan on the inside, second. Here comes the English splitter, Sheikh Albadu, and he runs by our champion. Robin Dancer moves into second. House Buster has been defeated today. And here is Sheikh Albadu. And he's running away from the best American sprinters, and he wins by five. And Pleasant Tap gets up for second. It's close for third. It is a shocker in the sprint. And the English sprinter, Sheikh Albadu, comes from about five lengths off the lead. House Buster did not run his race today. That was apparent from the very beginning. The final time was 109 and 1. Sheikh Albadu, the European invader. Last year, we saw De Jure jump a shadow, which kept him from taking the sprint. That should have told us that the European horses could sprint with the Americans. Pat Ettery today takes Sheikh Albadu to a five-length win, a shocker in the first race as the Breeders' Cup sprint sees Robert Levy's housebuster go down to defeat. 
Pick seven tickets hitting the ground all over America as the champion goes down to the European invader, Sheikh Al Badu. Nas and Tap, who came from well off it, but a real blow to the pride of American racing here as a sprinter from England beats our best at our forte. Tom? Tom Durkin, this appears to be Housebuster being loaded into the, it is Housebuster being loaded into the ambulance. Housebuster, the champion, as he went by us, we're located in the first turn, looked very stiff. We told you he takes the acupuncture treatments and now is being loaded into the horse ambulance. Uh, just in front of the Churchill Downs grandstand, here is an isolated replay of Housebuster. As Tom Durkin told us, he uh, broke sluggishly and never appeared to have his normal speed. Jockey Craig Fred has already gone to the whip here. And it was the horse coming from off the pace, Sheikh Al Badu, that came up on the outside. Here is Housebuster. He didn't gallop all the way out when he pulled up, was taken back in front of the grandstand and is now being loaded into the ambulance. Let's go to Dan Kenny with jockey Craig Perret. Dan? Okay, we're here with Craig Perret. Craig, the horse got away to a bad start, yet he seemed to be in position turning for home. When did you know he was in trouble today? He grabbed his quarter, leaving the gate, and tore his whole hoof off. Uh, he, uh, keeping all his weight off that leg, about the eight pole, he made the lead. He was going funny, he made a bad step. Then he went in his right leg. You know, he had the one injury in, in, in the right front out of the gate, and he carried himself to the eight pole. He made a fight. He got to the lead. I guess the pressure was on the left leg too much, and then that one on it. So this is the worst part of the game, is, you know, things like that. Okay. Thanks. That's from Craig Perrett. And there is the ambulance carrying Housebuster to the back stretch where the veterinarians will go to work on him. There is a trauma team of vets standing by for just this eventuality. Here's the champion, Housebuster. Craig Perrette said he grabbed a quarter coming out of the gate and was in this race. Trainer Donnie Von Hemmel, the trainer of Cle Clever Trevor, has claimed foul against Eddie Dallahousie who rides Pleasant Tap and finished second. And here again is Housebuster coming away from the gate from the two post position. He's in stall number two in that starting gate. Stumbled coming out and grabbed a quarter. And later, as uh, Craig Perrette told us, with pressure on that injured leg, the other leg was affected as well. And Housebuster, very stiff as he pulled up, didn't gallop all the way out, was immediately taken back and loaded into the ambulance. Jenny Ornstein. I'm walking with trainer Jimmy Kroll. He didn't get a chance to see what happened. Fred Perrette told us he stepped on his right front toward his quarter, but he thought he'd broken down in his left front. Did you get to see any of it, Mr. Kroll? No, I did not. I know. I, I'm, I'm like you. Yeah, I've seen it. I'm sure it's overwhelming and quite a shock. He seemed to warm up good. He seemed to run good to that You're point, fine. didn't he? Yeah, you fine. Well, we wish you the very best. He'll be retired now. I'm sure you're going back to the barn to check on him. Yes. Please let us know. We wish you the very best for Housebuster. So he did indeed break down in the left front, stepped on his right. We'll try to keep you updated. Okay, Jenny. Housebuster being taken to the back stretch where that trauma team will uh, go to work on him immediately. The winning jockey from Britain, Pat Ettery, and he's with Trevor Denman. Trevor? Standing here with the nine-time Inglius champion jockey, Pat Ettery. He'll be known to all Americans, winning the uh, Breeders' Cup on Pebbles back in 1985. Major upset, Pat. How did you achieve it out there? Well, my horse traveled real good for the race. The only worry I had was on the turn, because when I galloped him in the morning, he didn't he didn't take the, the bend too good. But today, he had horses outside of him, and he, he came around in the straight. I couldn't believe how easy I was going. And he really, up the stretch, he quickened. Right. Were any perturbed before the race about the off track here? The track is a sand track, and it was a little wet. Well, we worked him on the sand track, and he went really well before he came over here. And the trainer was very pleased, and so that's why they brought him here. Greatest race of his life? Oh, yes, without a doubt. Greatest thrill for you ever? Whatever, yes. It's always, always is. The winner, winner race of the Breeders' Cup was fantastic. Thank you very much, and good luck, Pat. Good luck for the rest of the afternoon. Now let's take it down to Tom Hammond. All right, Trevor, Sheikh Albadu, whose sire, Green Desert, ran last in the Breeders' Cup Sprint to Smile in 1986. Let's go to Bob Newmeyer for the trophy presentation. All right, Tom, thank you very much. The horse is owned by Halal Salem of Dubai, but uh, representing Halal is his racing manager, Joe Mercer. To make the presentation, we're delighted to have Mrs. Arthur Watson with us today. Mrs. Watson? 
Congratulations on behalf of the Breeders' Cup. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much indeed. Did you, it's wonderful. Did you think he had a legitimate shot on the dirt here today? Well, Alec and myself have always great faith in this horse, and we, had, we thought he had a tremendous shot today. And he takes everything in his stride, nothing's bothered him, and as you well saw there, he's a very good racehorse. The owner must be absolutely thrilled. Oh, we we're all thrilled to bits, the owner included. Congratulations. Our trainer was a theology student That's at right. Cambridge University. What got you into horses? Uh, well, I was interested in horses before the theology. The theology was just to check that I was on the right road. Great job. Unpredictable, we said at the top. This is unbelievable. Let's go to Tom Hammond. All right, Bob. Uh, Sheikh al the first European dirt winner at the Breeders' Cup, returning some hefty mutuals. 54 60, 21 60, 15 20. Pleasant tap. The result official now is second. Robin Dancer was third. The time 109 and 1. A shocker in the first race of the day. Pat Ettery, familiar to Canadian fans. You might remember last year he rode French glory to victory in the 1990 Rothmans International. Welcome back, everyone, to Sports Weekend Control. We continue coverage of the Breeders. Coming up, the Juvenile Phillies. The favorite is Preach with Julie Crone aboard, and this year there will be another female jockey in addition to Crone at the Breeders. Julie Crone is one of the most popular jockeys among the fans, and in 1988 became the first woman to ride in the Breeders. Today, she's joined by Ottawa's Francine Villeneuve, who broke her thigh bone in 1988, returned and won 43 races last year at Woodbine. This July, Villeneuve and Wilderness Song finished second in the Queen's Plate. It's my job. I do it every day. And I don't think of myself as being a girl against the guys. I'm just working out there with them. So I don't think it's any different, really. But it is an accomplishment for a Canadian jockey to ride in the Breeders, and being a woman makes it more special. It's, um, it's quite an honor to be asked to ride there. It's unbelievable, really. It's very prestigious. All the best in the world will be there, and want, everyone will be watching. So I couldn't have asked for any more. It's every rider's dream to ride in the Breeders, let alone being on one that has a really good shot. Julie actually from the Ottawa suburb of Winchester. Now she'll ride the Wilderness Song, part of the favorite entry with Dan Smartley and the Distaff. That's at 119 Eastern in about 50 minutes from now. By the way, the only previous Canadian favorite in the Breeders, a breeder starting in 1984, was Bess Arabian, 8-5 in the Juvenile Phillies in 1984. He finished a disappointing six. Still to come, of course, also the Turf Classic with Sky Classic during the afternoon. You'll hear from Jim Day and Ernie Samuel. Right now, let's go back live to the Breeders at Churchill Downs in Louisville. Sheikh al from England, the upset winner in the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Let's take a look at the uh, complete order of finish. Sheikh al Pleasant Tap and Robin Dancer. Senior Speedy was fourth. Then Media Plan, Clever Trevor. Housebuster winding up in the ninth position after breaking down in his left leg. We should say that it did not appear to be life-threatening for Housebuster. He was taken away in the ambulance. We move now to the Juvenile Phillies. That's the next race with Preach, the inside horse, the three-to-one morning line favorite. Culture Vulture, another European horse, is at five-to-one. Also at five-to-one, Speed Dialer. And there are the odds for the Juvenile Phillies race. The million dollars at a mile and a sixteenth will be coming up shortly. Let's go back to the story now on House Buster. Trevor Denman has a report for us. Trevor? I'm standing here with Dr. Owen. Uh, we do have an early examination of House Buster, and let's let Dr. Owen explain just exactly what it is. Let me put the question to you. Is he in a life-threatening situation? No, he is not, Trevor. That's a very important aspect of this. Uh, as a precautionary measure, he was put in the ambulance, carried back to his own stall. At first, they really didn't even require the ambulance, but we felt like that was best for the horse in this particular situation. He has a soft tissue injury to his left fore. At the same time, during the stress of the race, he clipped his heel on his right fore, but that's minor. That's just a minor skin laceration, and hopefully this is going to come along fine. We'll have a little more for you a little later, but right now we're, we're doing real well with him. And as soon as we get a report that he is back in his stall, we'll be glad to come back to you. Thank you very much. Heartening news there. Housebuster's going to be okay. Tom? All right, Trevor. Best news we've had today. Housebuster not in a life-threatening situation. Injured, but uh, was going to be retired anyway. And uh, 
It just we saw the ambulance there on the track taking him away and it it's a good point because after the tragedies of last year's Breeders' Cup, Mr. Nickerson, Shaker Knit, and of course, Go for Wine, Churchill Downs has made some extraordinary preparations in case there should be an emergency today. A horse should need emergency care. There are two new ambulances waiting at the track. These ambulances are specially equipped to load the horses, to keep them steady, and to take them, if need be, to a nearby clinic where the horse's injuries can be treated and cared for in the hospital barn, or if they need surgery, there are facilities and an operating room designed for animals of their size and weight. Extraordinary preparations made by Churchill Downs today to take care of any horses that may be injured during the Breeders' Cup program. And the horses arriving in the paddock for the Breeders' Cup juvenile fillies. This has been a division that has been absolutely wide open. We have a full field of 14 set to go to the post. And uh, it is one of those races where you can uh, throw darts and just about pick a winner, although Preach is a lukewarm favorite. Well, once again, we're pleased to have with us this year one of the finest thoroughbred trainers in the country, John Veach, who is a Breeders' Cup veteran. He won the 1985 Breeders' Cup Classic with Proud Truth. John, welcome back to our telecast. We saw a little bit of uh, deja vu with a, an injury in the first race, the sprint. Always seems to be the roughest race on the Breeders' Cup program. Is that because of the start is so critical in a six furlong dash? Oh, without a doubt. Position is very critical coming out of the sprint. Not only is it uh, important to get a good position, but to get a good clear run into, into the first turn. And of course, you don't have much time. I mean, you, the race is over in the blink of an eye. And as we, but as we saw today, all the front running horses stopped at the head of the stretch and the two uh, that finished one two came from behind so the track has definitely played a, a little bit of a, a part in the finish of the first race and probably in every race that we see today both on the turf and on the dirt will the weather conditions have caused the two racing surfaces to uh, reflect uh, who's going to win and who's going to lose. Will those surfaces change at all as the day wears on and how will it affect the, the I, I think it race? will particularly on the dirt uh, as we saw in 88 here uh, in the early parts of the, the running of the, the day uh, when the track was less cut up uh, with a lot of moisture in it uh, the speeds were very very fast and as we saw nine and one for the first three quarters was very fast uh, but uh, two, I think we ran two and four and some change uh, in 88 so I think the times will slow down well we've seen a European horse win the first Breeders Cup race and the biggest weekend in European racing is the Chiga weekend at Longchamp in Paris. Two days of high quality sport, including the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe, Europe's most important race. It's also become a weekend with an impact on Breeders' Cup Day. On the upside, Dejour and neither giving way. A dramatic confrontation here as they come down to the final 16th. And it is Dejour who forges to the front. Safely kept coming back at him. And Dejour took a bad step. Ten feet from the wire. Dejour had jumped in shadow. Nothing new, according to jockey Willie Carson. Had that ever happened to him before at any point in his career? Uh, actually, the last time he ran, he lost concentration. He won so easy, and he jumped in shadow at Longchamp. Um, he's the best horse. That impromptu leap cost Dejour the Breeders' Cup sprint. But it should have been no surprise. A few weeks earlier on Arc Day, Dejour built a big lead in the Prix de la Baie de Longchamp before jumping a shadow. He was still able to coast to victory that day, but not at the Breeders' Cup. And who would have guessed that a fractious horse that same day would lead to one of the triumphant moments later at the Breeders' Cup? Jockey John Reed is thrown by Whippet and suffers a shoulder injury. Opening up the mount on Royal Academy in the Breeders' Cup Mile for 54-year-old Lester Piggott. Trainer Michael O'Brien gave him a leg up and the legend of Lester grew. Well, you're 
Europe's biggest racing weekend provide in this year's Breeders' Cup. Several also rans from the Ark itself will race today, and there are a pair of two-year-olds to watch. This is American-bred Culture Vulture, a two-year-old filly in the pre Marcel Boussac. She's on the inside rail and just manages to hold off Hatou to win by a head. She could be a factor today in the juvenile fillies. And what about the sensational juvenile colt, Arazi, number three, running second here. He's also an American bred and the winner of six in a row, including this race, the Grand Criterium, a win which prompted Sheikh Mohammed to pay $5 million for half interest. And there is Culture Vulture, saddled and just about ready to head for the track in the juvenile fillies. Let's take a look at the current odds. Preach continues to reign as the favorite at five to two. Gone down just a tad. Six to one on Culture Vulture. The fans seeing a European horse win the first race, maybe not letting another one get away from them. Second choice, Speed Diner, currently at seven to two. We'll be tracked for the running of the million dollar juvenile fillies. The number one, Preach, bred and owned by the Hancock family's Claiborne Farm of Paris, Kentucky, the world's most prestigious thoroughbred breeding farm the last 50 years. Those famed all orange silks have never won a Breeders' Cup race. And the most successful woman jockey in history, Julie Crone, looks for her first Breeders' Cup win in her fifth attempt. Number two, Miss Iron Smoke, trained by California-based Brian Mayberry, whose grandfather, J.P. Mayberry, trained the Kentucky Derby winner here at Churchill Downs in 1903. Miss Iron Smoke beat Preach in the spinaway at Saratoga. Number three, La Spia, means the spy in Spanish. 82-year-old owner Albert Cubby Broccoli is best known for producing James Bond movies. La Spia was cooked like broccoli in the oak leaf stakes, but had an excuse, jumping tire tracks late in the stretch. Number four, Vivano, has never won a stakes race, but was second to preach in the Frisette. Jockey Chris McCarran has won three Breeders' Cup races. Number five is Soviet Sojourn who became the first graded stakes winner for her sire, Leo Castelli, who now stands at stud in the Soviet Union. Winner of two Del Mar stakes, ridden by Pat Valenzuela, who won this race on Brave Raj and would have won with Franz Valentine, but was disqualified. Number six is Antoine. Owner Peter Brandt won the 1988 Sprint with Gulch. Trainer Leroy Jolly won the 86 Turf with Manila and last year's Juvenile Phillies with Metal Star. This filly is named for a French Oriental model, a friend of Brandt's. She won the Matron. Number seven, Culture Vulture, trained by Paul Cole, who won this year's Epsom Derby with Generous. Culture Vulture had her biggest win in France, a head victory in the Marcel Boussac. Number eight, Spinning Round, owned by George Steinbrenner's Kinsman Stud, won two in a row. Number nine is Speed Dialer. Part owner Will Farish, a close friend of President George Bush, and has hosted Queen Elizabeth at his Lane's Inn farm. There's Speed Dialer. Jockey Pat Day, the leading money-winning Breeders' Cup jockey, inducted into the Hall of Fame this year. Number 10, Cadillac Women, second to speed dialer in the Arlington, Washington Lassie, then won the Indian Summer at Keeneland. Trainer Tom Pryor of Missouri owns part interest. Number 11, Pleasant Stage, won her first race in the Oak Leaf Stakes at Santa Anita three weeks ago. Cadillac Women is there, and Pleasant Stage galloping off as they warm up. Broker maiden in the Oak Leaf Stakes. And is a daughter of Pleasant Colony, who's the champion three-year-old colt. Miss Legality is number 12. Trainer Sonny Hine has worked for the State Department and the FBI, fluent in Mandarin Chinese. A lot of pick seven players will be speaking that if this filly wins. 13 is Ken de Saron, who was third in her only start in France, then won the Salima on the grass at Laurel in Maryland by nearly 10 links. Number 14, Queens Court Queen, trained by Hall of Famer Ron McAnally, beaten just a neck by spinning round in the Alcibiades. It is a wide open field for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Well, Preach is a lukewarm favorite among the contenders for the juvenile fillies. As we said, anybody could win this one. Bob Newmeyer takes a look at the leading contenders for the $1 million Breeders' Cup juvenile fillies. The likely fit when she broke her maiden at Saratoga, but then she finished third in the spinaway stakes as a heavy favorite. When she ran next in the frisette, jockey Julie Crone kept her relaxed off the pace, and she came on to blow by the field in the stretch. Well, I was on her last time in the post parade, and I just got on her, and she'd just be, you know, larger, and she walked real flat-footed, and she was very, very confident, and going to the starting gate, she was really, really quiet and confident, and she even threw in a few little, you know, ee, how Phillies do, and she was so happy, and just really looked forward to running, and she performed just how she felt like going to the gate. 
Another New York-based contender is N. Duong, trained by Hall of Famer Leroy Jolly. In the matron stakes, N. Duong circled the field to win easily. But in the frisette, Creech beat her by five lengths in her next start. A fast pace in this mile in a 16th contest could help this late closer. The leader of the West Coast contingent is Pleasant Stage, a daughter of 1981 Derby winner Pleasant Colony. She seems to perform better as her races get longer. In the Oak Leaf, for example, she closed to overtake several stakes winners while breaking her maiden. She's another filly who could be closing down the long Churchill Downs stretch. But possibly the most polished and consistent filly in the field comes from England. Culture Vulture has won four out of five, including two Group 1 victories in England and France. On Arc Weekend, she held on to defeat the best fillies in France. If she can duplicate her European form in this first attempt at racing under it, she can overpower this field. As the horses approach the starting gate for the juvenile fillies, Greg McCarran, Culture Vulture, is about to race on dirt for the first time. How did she look in the warm-ups? Tom, she looked really good. Uh, she was taking a good hold of the boy. It didn't seem like the dirt would bother at all. And I don't think there'll be quite as much emphasis put on whether they'll switch off the grass to the dirt any longer. As, as borne out by the first race, she looks really good. What about uh, the quick run to the first turn here? Does that present a problem for any of these uh, two-year-old fillies, many of them going around two turns for the first time? Well, that, that's one of the things the jocks are going to have to be aware of. If they get their horse geared too quickly going into that turn, they may have a little bit of trouble guiding them around, but all these boys know what they're doing, and most of the trainers will have at least worked the fillies through that turn a little bit to get them used to it. There shouldn't be any problem. You saw the favorite preach going into the one post position with a hood. Uh, put a hood over her eyes to facilitate loading her into the gate. Miss Iron Smoke is there in the blue and green silks in post position two. The race a mile and a sixteenth, a short run to the first turn. The purse a million dollars. And uh, all seven runnings of the juvenile fillies have produced champion two-year-old fillies. All these winners were champions. And who will emerge today as the winner, perhaps champion? Tom Durkin will give us the call. Moving into line now for the uh, Breeders' Cup for Juvenile Phillies. A competitive field of 14 lining up, assembled from all points across the USA and two young fillies from Europe as well. Post time favorite here. Post position number one is Preach, written by Julie Crow. Final horses taking their positions in the outside stations. A run of about uh, a bit less than a furlong before they hit the first of two turns here in this mile and 1 16th. Moving into post position number 13 will be, or into number 13, will be Kenda Sarone, one of the European invaders. Europeans now one for one on this Breeders' Cup day. The others taking outside post will be Queensport Queen, who may provide some early speed. Speed Dollar and Cadillac Woman and Pleasant Stage will break from the extreme outside post position. Expected to do her best running from off the pace. Kendis Arone balking just a bit in behind the starting gate. And with the urging of some assistant starters, we try to be moved in. Fat Day will break alongside her with Speed Dialer. Candace Rowan, a bit of a handful here, and finally moves in. Speed Dialer moving in nicely. The rest of the field very composed, in particular Preach, who has been in the gate the longest of them all. Queen's Court Queen is now moving in. Cadillac Woman should provide some of the early speed and then the late running Pleasant Stage. Their stable mate Pleasant Tap finished second in the previous race. Ready for the start here for the Juvenile Phillies and they are off. Spinning round is away quickly. There goes Miss Iron Smoke who's hustled up La Spia and Cadillac Woman will try for the lead as they race for the first turn. It's Miss Iron Smoke with the best speed. Cadillac Woman rushing up to put the pressure on early and Preach is tucked in up close to the pace and La Spia is right alongside her. Preach was steadied next to La Spia. It's two lengths back. Vivano is fifth and saving ground. Soviet Surgeon is sixth in between horses. Miss Legality is three wide round the first turn racing in seventh position. Spinning round is unhurried in the 
mid-pack. And on the outside, there goes Culture Vulture, and she begins to launch her bid from the back of the pack. She's now about nine lengths from the front. An Duong is still unhurried, lingering near the back of the pack. Kenda Saron is being pushed along. Pleasant Stage is near the back with Speed Dialer and Queen's Court Queen. The opening quarter went in 23 and 4. 47 and 4 here for the half as the field now moves into the far turn. On the inside, Miss Iron Smoke now trying to hold on to a short lead. Cadillac Woman, those two now, and the cadence quickens as they round the far turn. Culture Vulture looms a threatening presence on the outside. Julie Crone looking for running room with the favorite Preach. She's in a tight spot now in between horses, and La Spia moves into contention as they come to the quarter pole here at Churchill Downs. At the top of the stretch, Cadillac Woman is wide. Preach has room to run now, and here she comes charging on through. La Spia is there on the outside. Speed dialer, pleasant stage, weaving her way through the stretch here, looking for running room as they come down toward the final furlong, and La Spia has emerged with the lead. Pleasant stage is putting in a late run, but they are running out of ground. It's La Spia, pleasant stage with one final run here as they come to the wire. It'll be close, and pleasant stage gets their last stride. Very close indeed. La Spia was right there with her. It's a photo finish for the juvenile fillies. And it appeared to, from my view here that Pleasant Stage did it. She was desperate for running room through the stretch. Nowhere to go on the inside. Switched to the outside for the final 16th. And it looked like she just did nail La Spia in that last jump at the wire. Pleasant Stage, bred in Kentucky by Mrs. Thomas M. Evans and owned by the Buckland Farm of T.M. Evans, a filly by Pleasant Colony, who was champion three-year-old for T.M. Evans during his racing career. Pleasant Stage, again we see a horse come from off the pace, and Pleasant Stage just nipping La Spia in the final strides under Eddie Delahousie. Here's the stretch run again, and it appears that La Spia and Alex Solis are home free. La Spia out in the center of the track where the going might be just a tad better, goes to the front, Solis working hard with a right-hand whip. But moving to the inside, Pleasant Stage now in gear from Delahousie, hitting her a couple of times left-handed, and it is Pleasant Stage that just gets up at the wire to nip La Spia in a photo finish. And, of course, the result still unofficial. Eddie Delahousie bringing Pleasant Stage from behind, the unofficial winner in 146-2. and two. Pleasant stage in the juvenile fillies. We'll have the official results when we return. Smartly dominated horse racing in Canada this year. And the queen of Canadian racing is going to wear the crown, the triple crown, the bank of Montreal triple crown. Dead smartly, majestic in victory. It's close for place between Shiny Key and January Man. The voice of Dan Loisel, Dan smartly prepares for the distaff today. Owner Ernie Samuel is confident his horse can conclude a great season with a win in the biggest race of her career. There's money involved here, and it's big money. But what about the prestige of winning a race such as this? Oh, well, I think that's that's really what it, what it's uh, what it is about, uh, Jim. The, these great races, and and to show that uh, that you can compete, and if we can come out on top, uh, uh, that's that's the great honor, and. Uh, and, uh, and a great plus, I think, for Canada. Last year, Dan Smartly finished third in the juvenile fillies. Samuel and trainer Jim Day see the horses performing better for Canada this year. Oh, I think there's always that little extra notch anytime you're carrying the flag, and, and we do that when we come away and uh, just show, uh, uh, you know, this is the heart of horse country, and uh, as Willard and Song did a couple of weeks ago, uh, have a Canadian bred uh, win these important races, I think, uh, raises our profile and is uh, that extra exciting as well. Dan Smartly has won all seven races she's competed in in 1991. Today, she tries to make it eight in a row in the big one. Wilderness Song, three weeks ago, winning a big one, the grade one spinster at Keeneland. The distaff still to come as we take you back live to Churchill Downs in Louisville. Well, the photo sign is down, and Pleasant Stage is the unofficial winner of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Pleasant Stage has won only two races, both of the major stakes events in her last two starts. Tom Durkin, how did she do it? From post position number 14 on the extreme outside, you will see Pleasant Stage, who was a late-running filly, not be affected by this post position. 
because when they leave the starting gate, Eddie De La Husse will be very patient. He knows he's not going to try for the lead, and here, Pleasant Stage on the outside will make her way all the way over to the inside and get to a post position, uh, a rail position, as they move into the turn. Now, here is once again Pleasant Stage. She was last going into the back stretch, and she steadily made her way. We are at the top of the stretch now, and she will just weave her way through. De La Husse looking for any kind of run. Nowhere to go on the inside. Preach was there. He comes behind Cadillac Woman and Laspia, who now has the lead. Laspia now in front, and she will just miss in the final stages of the race. And acting like a good filly at this point, Pleasant Stage benefiting from her previous races. Uh, she was a little rank through the stretch in her previous races. She was straight as a string today under the guidance of Eddie De La Husse, and her breeding says, I love this stretch at Churchill Downs, and the longer we go, the better. Tom? It looked like it today. Tom Durkin is pleasant stage. Really enjoyed that uh, long stretch run, including the last couple of strides when she got up, giving Eddie De La Husse his third Breeders' Cup win. He had been aboard Prize and Princess Rooney. Let's go to Trevor Denman. I'm down here with Alex Solis and trainer Randy Winnick on La Sphere, just beaten the last jump. Now, La Sphere has done this at Santa Anita. She took a bad step, but that was for because of a shadow. There was nothing out there today, Alex. Why did she take that jump in the lane? Uh, well, she, she saw the ground shining, <coughs> shining a little bit from the sun, I guess, and uh, she was all by herself, uh, and all of a sudden she started ducking away and jumping and doing things like that. You know. Was she it a patch of water down there that she jumped um, over? Well, just a little bit of water in the, the shadow of the sun. Um, I guess that's what she saw, you know. And tell us how you felt at the top of the lane. Looked like you could win it from there, or you should win it from there. Yeah, I, I, come, out, I come out to the quarter pole, and I was going real easy. The sooner I asked it to run down the stretch, she accelerated. And in, in that particular moment, I thought I was a winner because uh, she accelerated so fast that I, I, I didn't think they were going to go by her. Thank you, Alex Elise, Randy Winnick. Let's go now down to Jenny. Eddie De La Husse, you really thread the needle coming through the stretch. We're going to take it from the top of the stretch and right. watch you finding room. People have said she's green, but she wasn't today, wasn't she? No, she was fine today. She's still a little green, but she's not as bad. She, uh, right here, they started coming over, so I didn't want to take a chance. I, I got her dropped back a little bit, and I got her to the outside. And uh, when I did, she really started coming on. As you can see here, I'll come between these horses, and I started hitting the left hand, and she really started getting into it right there. I wasn't sure if we were going to get there because it was, the wire was getting there quick, but she did get there. So just, it was great. Just about when Laspia changed leads, you caught yeah. her. Is she an improving filly now? I think she's going to improve more and more. She should. But certainly not green today. Her daddy, Pleasant Colony, won the Derby here. Congratulations, Thank Peter you very much. Let's go to Dan Kenny now. Speaking of changing leads, they Thank call you. it changing legs in Europe. And jockey Richard Quinn told Paul Cole that Culture Vulture was traveling well, but when she hit the turn, she got confused and doesn't change. So, Paul, when Arazi has to make that same move, do you think it's going to give him a lot of difficulty? Uh... No, I don't think so. No, I think that this filly ha actually leads with the other leg, and I think that's the, been the problem today. She she just didn't handle it. You could see the ability there when she moved up into second place, but the, the dirt plus the lead, I think, has uh, been the main cause of the defeat. Thanks very much, and now let's go to Bob Newmeyer. It's a moment for the presentation, but Pleasant Stage, the winner, paying 13 67 40 and 5 60 La Spia second, Cadillac women third, the exact at 386.20. Now let's go to Bob Newmeyer for the presentation. All right, thank you very much. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Mellon Evans are here of Buckland Farm, and they are thrilled about the results. James E. Bassett the third, the president of Breeders' Cup Limited, with a trophy presentation. On behalf of the Breeders' Cup, we're delighted to present you this trophy. A wonderful race, a wonderful ride, and a beautiful filly. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much, Ed. It's a great pleasure to be here. We certainly enjoyed it. And there's a story behind these flowers, I'm oh, told. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but when uh, Pleasant Colony won uh, the Derby, <laughs> we never saw the blanket because somebody took it. So you have it now and you've got, got a, it. You've got a Breeders' Cup with the Derby. The <laughs> From the woman who brought it, Christopher Speck, and congratulations. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay. Thanks. Happy bunch of people. One good thing about this job, I get to be with happy people all day long. <laughs> Let's go back to Tom. <laughs> all right, Bob. Happy indeed. Pleasant tap for the Evans and trainer Chris Speckert. Second in the sprint and Pleasant Stage wins the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. The distaff is next. 
The sun makes an appearance at Churchill Downs. It hasn't warmed things up much, though. A chilly day at the Downs for Breeders' Cup Day. Here's the complete order of finish in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Pleasant stage. You can make her the champion two-year-old filly off for two straight wins. Las Villas second, Cadillac women third. There's the complete order of finish. Preach, the favorite, winding up seventh. Andwang was eighth. Culture Vulture from Europe, ninth. And the complete order of finish in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Now, next up, we'll see Phillies and Mares in the distaff. And the morning line for the distaff finds the Canadian horse dance smartly as the favorite, coupled in the betting with Wilderness Song as the entry and opening and the morning line at even money. Even money on Wilderness Song and dance smartly. The uh, favorites, as you see the rest of the odds, morning line, Versailles Treaty at 7 to 2. Well, John Veach, we're coming up to the distaff. And last year we saw that go for one by a COA match that uh, ended up in tragedy. But the distaff always provides us uh, with some great sport on Breeders' Cup Day. Personal ends and here at Churchill Downs was a tremendous race. And a chance to see Dan Smartly, who's been sensational in Canada. She has. She really has. She's probably been the best Canadian filly that we've ever seen. And she has the opportunity today to become the best in the world. If she wins today, I think that... Uh, that she is meeting all of the best Americans. And uh, with that, uh, she could sense the title that she already has in the North to what she can do in the South. Well, we can't uh, approach the distaff without thinking of Gopher Wand and last year. These horses are so beautiful, so powerful, and yet so fragile. We first became aware of Gopher Wand when she ran and won the 1989 Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. She had grace and style and heart. The same heart and competitive nature that pushed her to super equine effort. Effort that her body eventually could not withstand. But her effort and courage we will never forget. Go for one. This Saturday afternoon, still morning in some parts of the West. I'm Brian Williams at Sports Weekend Control in Toronto. Up next, it's the Distaff. The Canadian entry is favored. Remember, since 1984, when the breeders began, Canadian horses have yet to win. They are 0 for 18. The Samson entry of Dance Smartly and Wilderness Song, the even money favorite. You've heard the American trainers talking about this horse. Most experts, Dan Smartly, I'm talking about, pick Dan Smartly to win. Don't forget Wilderness Song, a very strong filly with his picks on this race. Once again from Louisville, here's Jim Bennett. Brian, the distaff is up next, and it's for the girls. And, of course, this is the race that many Canadian fans have been waiting for. Will Dan Smartly, the first lady of Canadian racing, be able to drink from the coveted cup? We've been waiting a long time for a Canadian bred to win, and I think this is her best chance. She'll win it if she runs with the same power and precision that she has competed with in her previous seven wins. As for the other, there's a tough one in here from New York. Her name is Queena. She's won five in a row. As for some of the others, well, there's many challenging her, but perhaps fit to scout could fill the show award. All right, Jim, as we take a look at Jim's picks, again, Wilderness Song will be written by Francine Villeneuve. Don't write off Wilderness Song. She won a grade one spinster three weeks ago at Keeneland, Kentucky. And it's interesting that the favorites have had a rough time so far in the first two races, actually in the first three races of the day. The Abrogate Stakes, which was not televised, but was the first race of the day at Churchill Downs, was also won by a long shot. Will the Canadian drought end at Churchill Downs in Louisville? Dan Smartly and Wilderness Song are carrying the Canadian colors as we take you back live to the Breeders at Churchill Downs in Louisville. Welcome back to Churchill Downs. Hope you'll stay with us at the on Churchill Downs home stretch, which we've seen play uh, such a big part in the first two races of the day, both early winners coming from off the pace. Here's an update on the odds now, and even more heavily favored is the entry, Wilderness Song and Dance Smartly, now held at 2-5, to 2-5, to five, double figure odds on all the others you see there. And as we look at the second panel, second choice in the wagering is Versailles Treaty, and third choice is Quina. At 6-1, to one, Versailles Treaty and Quina, both trained by Shug McGahee. And the sun coming out has upgraded the condition of the track. The track now officially listed as fast, and the turf course still held as firm, although it has to be holding a lot of moisture after the rain of yesterday. But the track now officially fast as we come up to the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Breeders' Cup Distaff, and... 
John Veach, I know you've been in New York, your home base, and if there is uh, an upset of Dan Smartly in this race, could it come from the New York-based Shug McGahee Phillies, Quina or Versailles Treaty? I would certainly have to think so, Tom. Both uh, Quina and Versailles Treaty have, have been very consistent Phillies all year long. Uh, they're very well bred. They're certainly trained by, by a Superman and Shug McGahee. So uh, if, if there is a Philly that uh, can overcome uh, the brilliant uh, Dan Smartly, it, it would have to be one of these two. Well, of course, we have seen something uh, today that we always see in racing. <laughs> something come out of the woodwork uh, that nobody expects but uh, uh, those would be the the, the two that, that might dethrone the queen there is Suge McGay he's tightening the girth and uh, Suge got off to kind of a slow start had some personal problems this year but about Saratoga hit his stride and has come up with a terrific finish to the year Suge McGay he back in form well we mentioned a possible upset and we certainly have seen some surprises some pick seven players hurting after the first two races but the distaff the only race on the championship day card that has had all seven favorites go off at odds on and the favorite to win one on this year's Breeders' Cup card. Breeders' Cup distaff is over a mile and an eighth. The purse is a million dollars and it's sponsored by Consort Hairspray. There is an entry in the race, the Sam Sun Farm owned and Jim Day trained entry, which begins with number one, Wilderness Song. Wilderness Song is supposedly the weaker half of the entry, yet all she did was win Keeneland Spinster Stakes and five of the previous seven distaff winners prepped in the spinster. This filly sired by Wild again, who won the first Breeders' Cup Classic and Francine Villeneuve becomes the second female to ride in a Breeders' Cup race, Julie Crone the first. 1A is Dan Smartly, third in the juvenile fillies last year, but she hasn't lost in seven races since then. The first filly to win the Canadian Triple Crown and beating the boys again in the Molson Million. A win today would make her the all-time top money winning filly and mayor. Trainer Jim Day won an equestrian gold medal on the Canadian team at the 1968 Olympics. Two is fit for a queen, a five-year-old mare owned by the Hermitage Farm of Warner Jones, chairman of the board of Churchill Downs. He says this thoroughbred business is about 90% luck that she'll need for fit for a queen to win today. Number three, Till Forbid, trained by former professional bull rider Carl Nafsker of unbridled fame. Third in the spinster, she gives Shane Sellers his first Breeders' Cup ride. Sellers broke the jockey's record for wins at Arlington International this summer. Number four, Lady Dacord has never won a stakes race, but is conditioned by Nick Zito, who worked his way up from hot walker to derby winning trainer when Strike the Gold won the Roses last May. Number five, Private Treasure, 64-year-old Joe Pierce Jr. still works with his dad, Joe Sr., also a trainer, now 85 years old, and co-breeder of this filly, who won a stake at the Meadowlands, then was fourth in the spinster. Number six, Richard's Lass, owner Robert Perez and trainer Alfredo Coyas, both born in Buenos Aires but now live in New York. They sent Senor Speedy to the post in the sprint. This filly was last behind Quina in the Ruffian. Number seven, brought to mind, Tadahiro Hodahama, the owner, is a Tokyo businessman. Brought to mind became only the third horse to sweep Hollywood Park's three top distaff races earlier this year. But as the favorite in the spinster, she stumbled at the start, was bumped, and wound up 13th. Trainer McAnally looks to win the distaff for the third straight year. Number eight, Fit to Scout, trained by Jack Van Berg, the winningest trainer in history, nearly 5,600 of them, including all-time leading money winner Ali Sheba. Biggest win for Fit to Scout this year, the John A. Morris handicap at Saratoga. Number nine, Versailles Treaty, who could forget Suge McGay, he trained personal ensign with an impossible finish, taking the 88 distaff here. Well, this filly half of the one-two punch that Suge has in 1991. Versailles Treaty has not been worse than second in 10 starts this year, winning six times. Number 10, Train Robbery. D. Wayne Lucas leads all Breeders' Cup trainers with 10 winners and over $8 million in earnings, but Train Robbery appears overmatched here. Number 11, Grand Girlfriend is another Lucas-trained long shot owned by Chicago agricultural commodities trainer Edward Cox. He and his wife Rosemary have 10 children, ranging in age from 30 to 10. No wonder they like to come to the racetrack. And number 12 is Quina. That's the nickname of owner Emery Hamilton's sister. Mrs. Hamilton's grandfather, Robert Clayberg, owned the King Ranch in Texas, also owned Kentucky Derby winners, Assault and Middle Ground. Quina has led the resurgence of the McGahee stable this year, winning her last five starts. Greg McCarran, how do they look off um, the post parade? Naturally, I've been watching the, the favorite entry, and they both look really, really good. Just a little note on Francine Villeneuve on Wilderness Song. She suffered a, a, a real bad injury not too long ago, broken pelvis, and they thought it was career-ending. And this is a, a, a great testament to her determination and her ability, and it shows the confidence that Jim Day has in her to ride in this race. Can they beat Dan Smartly today in the distaff? 
That's the question Bob Newmeyer answers as we look at the top contenders for the Breeders' Cup distaff at a mile and an eighth. The story of this year's distaff revolves around two countries, two trainers, and their four horses. America's Suge McGahee leads off with Queena, a five-year-old former sprinter who tries to stretch out to a mile and an eighth in this race. She's won three grade ones in a row, but Queena still can't get any respect. She wasn't favored in any of those races, and her biggest winning margin was this half a length in the Ruffian. McGahee's other contender is the talented three-year-old Versailles Treaty. She also captured three grade ones in a row this summer. In the prestigious Alabama at Saratoga, her side treaty was clearly the best over a mile and a quarter. There's no doubt about her ability to handle distance, but she may not be able to handle a powerful one-two punch from Canada. They come from the stable of Canada's leading trainer, Jim Day. He's a former Olympic gold medalist in equestrian events, and Day compared his Olympic thrills to a success in thoroughbred racing. It's just impossible to compare something with, with an Olympic gold medal. That's a, you know, just a rare thing in a person's life. So, uh, but winning our Canadian Triple Crown this year was very satisfying, very personally satisfying. And if we ever had a chance to win a Breeders' Cup race, that would be, uh, you know, even more satisfying. This is Jim Day's second stringer in the Breeders' Cup distaff, Wilderness Song. She's finished in the money in 14 of 16 lifetime starts. In the spinster at Keeneland, she led most of the way, was headed in the stretch, and came on again to win. Canada's Francine Villeneuve gets the ride. The mark of a great female horse is the ability to beat the males. Dance Smartly has pulled off that task four times in a row, while winning all seven of her starts this year. Canada's Triple Crown winner faced some tough American horses in the Molson Million. Why So Free was favored in the betting, but he was just another male who couldn't handle this superstar filly. To move back to female competition today could be an easy step for Dance Smartly. And there is Dance Smartly. Let's update the odds on Dance Smartly. The entry, the Samsung Farm entry, Wilderness Song and Dance Smartly, one to two now. One to two favorites on Dance Smartly and Wilderness Song, the entry. Let's go to Jenny Ornstein for a report. Shug McGahee just saddled Versailles Treaty and Queena. How do you beat Dance Smartly? What's the strategy, Shug? Well, we're, doing, we're gonna let them run their own race the way they want to. I think they'll both be a little bit off the pace and make one run. And you know, I don't know whether we can be Dan Smartly or not. I just don't have anything to judge her by, you know, off her previous form except an exceptional record. And, you know, we'll just have to see if her Canadian form travels to here. And if anyone has a shot, you do in a double pack here at First Aid Treaty, Treaty and Queena, Shug McGahee. Let's go back to Tom. All right, the horse is loading into the gate for the distaff and something to be aware of here. Both Wilderness Song and Dan Smartly like to race close to the lead and perhaps this drying out track is a little tiring to the front runners early in the races. We've seen come from behind efforts win the first two races, the sprint and the juvenile fillies. Remember, each winner of the distaff has been honored at the end of the year as an Eclipse Award as champion older filly or mayor. We'll see if we decide a champion here. Tom Durkin has the call. And the big favorite in this eighth Breeders' Cup distaff, Dance Smartly. Impressive credentials this year. Winner of the Canadian Triple Crown. But she will be tested this afternoon by American rivals. Two of the main contenders, Queena and Versailles Treaty. Queena now about to take her spot in the extreme outside post position. Dance Smartly. Tomley in the starting gate, as are the other fillies and mares. We know just a touch reluctant from the jockey Mike Smith. Wilderness Song, the quicker early half of the Samsung Farm entry. Queen and now in the starting gate. We're ready for a start. And they're off. And it is Wilderness Song who bounds right to the lead. Fit for a Queen is right there. Richards last now is on the attack early, brought to mind. And on the far outside, Dance Smartly. And now Pat Day gathers her back. They move for the first turn, and Richards last now will provide the early pace here in the distaff. Brought to mind is ranging up three wide. Fit for a Queen is there toward the inside. Wilderness Song just off the pace in between horses was forced to steady there. Is now back racing for it. And the Canadian Triple Crown winner, Dance Smartly, is settled in in mid 
back now about six lengths from the front. And then it's fifth to scout toward the inside, now racing in sixth position, a gap of three, back to an unhurried Versailles Treaty. Then Private Treasure, Till for Bid now, beginning to make steady progress toward the inside. Then Grand Girlfriend, Quina is better than 15 lengths from the front, then it's Lady Dacor, and a sluggish train robbery trails the field. 23 and one for the quarter, they've run a half here in 47 and one fifth seconds. And long shot, Richards last leads the way, 80 to one, and on the lead now as the field enters the final turn. Brought to mind right there, ready to attack on the outside. Fit for a queen, tracking the lead intently in third. Dance Sparkly, Pat Day now is still motionless. She has yet to do her best running, but now there she goes. Dance Smartly with a sweeping move on the outside is coming toward the lead. Grand Girlfriend also kicks in. Queen is coming hard on the extreme outside now as the field comes down toward the final furlong. Brought to mind with a short lead. Dance Smartly is right there on the outside. Fit for a queen, brave at the rail third. Here comes Versailles, Treaty was kicking in late, but it is Dance Smartly. She takes the lead under Pat Day's urging and pulls away here by two. It is Versailles Treaty, but it's too late and not enough. And it is Dance Smartly who strides under the line, undefeated this year, and the undisputed queen of racing on this continent. There she was, Dance Smartly and an affectionate Pat from one Pat Day. You wrote a perfect race, and Dance Smartly is once again flawless. And the excitement in the Samson Farm box. Ernest Samuel and the other uh, family members on hand to see their champion Philly Dan Smartly run like a champion. Pat Day aboard for his sixth Breeders' Cup win. And Pat Day, Dan Smartly, you asked her to run when you got into the stretch and she responded like the champion. Pat Day, can you hear us? Yes, sir. That day, when you asked her to run, it looked like you didn't ask her to run until you were already well into the stretch, and she responded with a quick move. I can't understand you. I can hear you, but I can't understand you. <laughs> a lot of people say that, Pat. I've had that problem many times. <laughs> well, anyway, Dan Smartly you. and Pat Day coming on to victory here in the Breeders' Cup Distaff, the first favorite to win today. We'll try to get with Pat Day when we return, but it is Dan Smartly comes from just off the pace and wins the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Perhaps maybe we'll see them on a Breeders' Cup day. We've just, the Canadian bred filly Dance Smartly by Danzig from Classy and Smart by Smarten. Pat Day taking her to victory in the Distaff. Unofficially, Dance Smartly the winner after a moderate pace in 150 and four fifths. Dance Smartly changing a bit of tactics as she was able to hold off the late charging Versailles Treaty brought to mind who had made the lead in the stretch winding up third and it appeared to me that Dan Smartly was uh, back just a little further than she normally is in her races she was back some nine lengths Tom Durkin called it off the pace off that moderate pace that was set to early in the race Pat Day asked her to accelerate when she got into the stretch and she did that and Tom Durkin take us through that stretch one as you said uh, Pat Day is still motionless when he did begin to move on the filly she responded there she is right there Again, this is classic Pat Day as uh, Dan Smartly has now taken the lead. The first time he goes to the whip is inside the eighth pole, sensing that Versailles Treaty was coming late, but a very patient ride. And I think with this victory here, Dan Smartly can uh, take her place with some of the other great winners of this race. Bayakoa, personal incident indeed, Lady Secret, Princess Rooney, and she fits the bill as well with them. Dan Smartly, it really was a superior effort, Tom. Dan Smartly. Getting ready to make her entrance for a final bow into the winner's circle. This was the action. Ernest Samuel and company watching Dan Smartly rack up yet another victory. Her eighth consecutive race that she has won dating back to the juvenile fillies last year when she finished third. So Breeders' Cup Day a much happier affair for the Samuel family in 1991. Jenny Ornstein talking to Angel Cordero. Angel was aboard Versailles Treaty and a game effort. Is there any excuse for her in finishing second? Well, it's a good filly that win, there's no doubt about that. My filly run good. She didn't handle it going the first part and she was way back. And uh, I followed Pat all the way around. And I made a run at him at the end, but that filly's a good filly. My filly run good, I'm proud of it, but she could hold the track the first part. And she, she was gaining. too far back, yeah. She was farther back than I wanted, but she did. 
made up a lot of ground and she calls very good. Is she used to running a little bit longer perhaps? Well, she could run any distance. This time doesn't bother her. She wins seven eighths and she wins a mile and a quarter. She was running the last part and I'm proud of her. She just got a run today by a better filly today. Indeed, she was second to a fine filly dance smartly. Versailles Treaty number nine, second with Angel Cordero. Let's go now to Trevor Denman. I'm here with Shug McGahee. Shug, take us through the race up there. What is it like watching your filly? She obviously ran a huge race. She did. She finished good. Angel told me she didn't really handle the track real well the first part of it. She wasn't up on the bridle, but, you know, that didn't matter. We wanted her to be back a little bit. I really didn't care where she was, but uh, just as long as Angel waited a long time, and he did, and uh, we made one run. We were just second best today. You'll be back again next year? I sure hope so. Okay. Hope. Let's go now to Dan Kenny. Okay, we've got Pat Day here. Pat, earlier in the week, a rival trainer said he's seen Dan Smartly race, but he's never seen her run. In other words, she's never been asked for her best. Did she need everything today? Well, not really. Uh, the jock probably got a little excited down there inside the eighth pole. I went to my left hand and, and uh, asked her to run on just a little bit, uh, uh, probably more than what was really necessary, but million dollars, horse of the year, all-time winning horse, uh, winning distaff. You know, it was a lot of lot on the line here, and I certainly didn't want to get caught uh, sleeping at the switch, if you would. And, and so uh, right down here, you'll see me put my stick over my left hand, and, and from here on, I, I asked her to run, and she responded big. And uh, my congratulations, Mr. Samuel, Mr. Day. They've done a fine job with this filly all year. I'm just happy to be a part of this. And how would this filly rank among some of the fine fillies you've ridden? Well, she got to rank right up there with the tops. You know, uh, she just surpassed uh, Lady Secret, and I was very fortunate to have ridden, ridden her in her uh, Eclipse Award-winning course of the year season, and um, uh, this filly's got to be right there next to her. Okay, let's go back to Tom Hammond. Pat Day with his sixth Breeders' Cup victory as Dan Smartley, $3.240, $2.40 on the winning entry, Versailles Treaty, that late run got second, brought in to mind was third, and a 960 payoff on that exacta as uh, Dan Smartly becomes the all-time money-winning female, $3,083,000. Let's go to Bob Newmeyer. All right, Tom Hammond, thank you very much. Presenting the trophy for the Breeders' Cup this staff, we're delighted to have Robert London, the general manager of Alberto Culver USA. Robert? Thank you, Bob. Mr. Samuel, on behalf of the Alberto Culver Company and its sponsoring brand for today's race, Consort Hair Care Products for Men, it is our pleasure to present to you the trophy for this year's Breeders' Cup Distaff. It was a great race. Thanks. Thank you so much. Ernie, we have a shot of you as your prized filly was oh. roaring down the lane. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, I don't know what I was doing, but she's something special. And uh, You see well, what you're doing. Your heart's going a little pitter patter there. <laughs> well, I get a workout out of that one. <laughs> To well, breed the horse, this is the Breeders' Cup after yes, all, to breed and, a champion uh, like this. We her, and of course uh, our wonderful mare, and then the first daughter won the Oaks, and uh, here we are, and uh, she's never been tried before, so I don't know how hard, I'll have to watch the replay, because I could hardly see uh, whether she had to really work at it today, but she just had it all her own way up to now, and uh, what a wonderful feel like this, uh, we're, we're just in heaven, and Jimmy Day uh, did a wonderful job of nursing her along, and uh, well, just magic, just magic. Good job, Jim Day, congratulations. We've had owners from Dubai, from Canada, and from Kentucky. This is an international event, to be sure. All right, Bob Newmeyer. Lady Secret won the distaff in 1986. She was the all-time leading money-winning female until today. Dan Smartly has passed her with that title. Doff your cap to a grand lady, the champion Dan Smartly. How many times it would for the lead? Grand girlfriend also kicks in. Queen is coming hard on the extreme outside now as the field comes down toward the final furlong. Brought to mind with a short lead. Dance smartly is right there on the outside. Fit for a queen. Brave at the rail third. Here comes Versailles. Treaty was kicking in late, but it is. Dance smartly. She takes the lead under Pat Day's urging and pulls away here by two. It is Versailles. Treaty, but it's too late and not enough. And it is Dance smartly who strides under the line, undefeated this year, and the undisputed queen of racing on this continent. You saw Ernie Samuel celebrating following the race I've just talked about. Complete order of finish. Next up, we move to the grass for the first time in the Breeders' Cup mile. One mile on the turf for a million dollars. Here are the morning line odds with in excess. Bit of controversy following his entry in this race rather than the classic and tight spot unbeaten on the turf. Five to two on the morning line.
Well, John Veach, we've seen many fine jockeys and trainers on display here today, and we were talking about Ron McAnally, who has very much been a factor in Breeders' Cup races, and he had a great horse, John Henry. Is he one of the all-time greats that you've witnessed race? Probably so, and uh, you've certainly got to take your hat off to Ron. Uh, John Henry probably went through five or six trainers and uh, a couple of owners the same uh, that owned him twice the same uh, during his career and still couldn't get anything out of him, and Ron did a super job with patience and, uh, and understanding and, and really campaigned him over three or four years uh, brilliantly. Well, you know, I'll always remember in the aftermath of the Go For One tragedy last year, the hurt on the face of Ron McAnally. By a Coa, the filly he trained, had just won a million-dollar race, but there was no joy, only grief for the other man's horse. That's a pretty good indication of the character of McAnally, who has gone from humble beginnings to the Hall of Fame. Mayakoa, her distaff victory tarnished with the death of Go For One. For trainer Ron McAnally, only sadness. They give their, their lives for our enjoyment. It just made me sick, you know. I mean, I couldn't... It was hard for me to cope with it at the time because I love the animals so much. The one he loved most is the legendary John Henry. The two-time horse of the year, now retired in Kentucky, John, but John. still gets visits from Ron. John, John. Hey. What are you doing in there? When I go up to a stall now, he remembers me. I, I just, uh, matter of fact, lately I haven't even rattled a bag to let him know I had something for him, and he still recognizes that I, he'll be standing there in the corner asleep, and I just holler at him. He comes walking over there to me and starts pawing. He knows I'll have something for him. McAnally's years of success with John Henry and others led to his induction last year into Racing's Hall of Fame, a moment he calls one of the highlights of his career. He had come a long way from his childhood home in Covington, Kentucky, growing up here in what was in those days an orphanage. When I look back on it, uh, it taught me a lot of manners and a lot of uh, uh, people treat poli people politely and, and with respect. And uh, when I look back on it, I, I don't regret it a bit. You know, I do regret losing our mother and father when we were very young. Many wonder if McAnally's childhood is the reason that some of his successful horses had been unwanted by others. Bayakoa has a pronounced parrot mouth or overbite. Okay. Sea Cadet was born without a tail. Casalaria has only one eye. And Especiante is unusually big. I thought about that too, you know, like John Henry, no one really wanted him when he was sort of kicked around when he was young. And so, I don't know, it's, uh, I think it's just a coincidence, you know, but uh, uh, it's for some strange reason, I, I never seem to get those real high-priced, well-bred horses to train. Uh, the horses leaving. Through the years, Ron McAnally hasn't changed, and neither has his love for his job and his horses. I can't think of uh, what else I could possibly do except this. You just uh, enjoy being around the horses. They all they're doing is waiting for you to uh, in the morning to you know let you know what they you, you want them to do, and uh, they just ask for a little uh, feed and water and, and never talk back to you. you know, like the kids, you know. Uh, I, I think it's uh, it's wonderful. And there is Ron McAnally here at Churchill Downs. His brought to mind just third in the Breeders' Cup distaff. And coming up later today, he'll have a horse in the Classic that has a chance at Horse of the Year honors. He'll saddle Festine in the Classic, the last race of the day. Crowd at Churchill Downs. Still talking about a couple of upsets. And speak on in the sprint, a big upset. Sheik Albadu becomes the first European Breeders' Cup winner on dirty paid 5460. Champion Housebuster injured. In the Phillies, Pleasant stage. Now probably the champion two-year-old filly after winning the juvenile Phillies. And in the Breeders' Cup distaff, Dan Smartly, the first Canadian bred Breeders' Cup winner, the champion paying $3.00 and uh, the sixth Breeders' Cup win for jockey Pat Day. That's the way the first three races have gone in the national pick seven, eight and a half million dollars in the pool. Kuyanga, we understand, in the paddock uh, just uh, threw a shoe moments ago, and the farrier who stands by has put a new shoe on her. So uh, Kuyanga has just been reshod by the farrier who stands by for just such a case in the paddock. Well, the mile coming up, let's take a look at the odds, current odds for the 
Breeders' Cup mile, one mile on the turf. Priolo at six to one in excess. Hasn't run on the turf for a while, December of last year, but the fans think he can do it. Two to one right now on in excess, and he is the favorite. Tight spot who has never lost on the grass. The Ron McAnally trainee's second choice at three to one. That's the way the odds seven eighths of a mile turf course, which is rooted in sand, a little different than some of the turf courses. It handles water very well, and the official designation is firm despite the rain of yesterday, but it has to be just a bit yielding, and that will favor some of the European runners who have been on it many times. Most of the American runners have not been on a rather soft turf course. Mile contenders, you have an interesting mix of European and American runners. Let's take a look at the top contenders in the mile. Should trainer Bruce Jackson's in excess win the Breeders' Cup mile, he could be horse of the year. Although this Irish bred is six for 12 lifetime in the grass, in excess hasn't raced in a turf course in nearly a year. This last minute change back to the turf has added another element of early speed to a race where pace is often the deciding factor. Scan has never even tried the turf, but students of racing bloodlines believe the three-year-old will love the lawn. Trainer Scotty Schulhofer hopes they're right. On his damn side, it, uh, it's all of it is turf. And uh, I worked him in Saratoga on the turf. He handled it. He took to it like a duck does the water. And he actually, I worked him at Belmont last week, and Jose Santos worked him, and he thought he moved actually moved better on the turf than he did on the dirt. There are no doubts about tight spot. He's a perfect eight for eight in the grass and America's reigning turf champion. But can tight spot hold off the challenge of the always dangerous Europeans? Second set, Shadaid and this three-year-old filly, Kuyunga, are all top-class European milers. All three are capable of winning this most competitive of Breeders' Cup races. But the strongest European miler just may be the fast-closing Priolo from the barn of the crafty French trainer Francois Boutin. In last year's mile at Belmont Park, Priolo was blocked, but still recovered to finish a fast-closing third to jockey Lester Pickett and Royal Academy. And there's a look at Kayanga, who is being re-shod. Dan Kenny, what about a report? She has a habit of kicking her hind legs while she was being saddled. She no, kicked no, the stall behind her and loosened her shoes, and her shoes had to be reset. But she's fine now, and she's joined the walking ring parade. So the shoes have been reset on Kayanga. John Veach, uh, is this a common occurrence? I know they do have a blacksmith standing by. Should it uh, hurt her chances in the race at all? No, it really shouldn't, uh, Tom. It, it is not uh, a common occurrence, but it does happen. And as you say, that's why they have a blacksmith there. Uh, if... Uh, Generally, what that it does is just spread the shoe a little bit. Of course, these are made out of soft aluminum uh, held by about three and a half inch nails, and a good jolt to a solid uh, surface will make it spread a little. All right, the horses are on the track for the Breeders' Cup Mile, sponsored by Toyota. Number one, Shada Yid, owned by Sheikh Hamdan Al Maktoum, Dubai's Minister of Finance, and one of the four brothers who have changed the face of the thoroughbred industry over the last 10 years. Now the world's foremost owners and breeders. This is a three-year-old filly, won the classic English Thousand Guineas. Number two, Dan Seuss de Soir, another three-year-old European-trained filly who won the French Thousand Guineas. Number three is opening verse who was seventh in the classic last year. Opening verse is owned by Alan Paulson, who worked his way up from mechanic to pilot to aircraft designer to the chairmanship of Gulfstream Aerospace. Number four, Priolo, was third in the mile last year, beaten just a length by Royal Academy and ridden by Freddie Head, who twice uh, won a Breeders' Cup on Miesk. Number five is Scan, owned by 78-year-old William Hagen Perry, trained by 65-year-old Scotty Schulhofer, and Scan has been very good lately, but on the main track, this is his first race on turf. Number six is Star of Cozine, Clover Racing Stable, the name of the partnership, headed by former racing writer Barry Irwin and newspaper handicapper Jeff Siegel. They put up $120,000 to supplement this goal to the race. He's won three of four since trying the turf. Number seven, In Excess, the current leader for Horse of the Year honors after winning four straight big New York stakes. Trainer Bruce Jackson wrestled all week with the decision whether to run in the Classic or the Mile. He chose the Mile. He's not run on grass since last December, but has six wins in 12 lifetime turf races. 
Number eight, Kuyanga. This is the three-year-old filly that threw the shoe. Based in Ireland, though owned by a Japanese and named for an Australian turf course. Number nine, Tight Spot, has a shot at Horse of the Year. You can't fault his record. He's a perfect eight for eight on turf. Five of those races this year. Has early speed and Lafitte Pinkai. Number 10 is second set, Richard Duchesswa, the owner, chairman of Arlington International Racecourse in Chicago. This Colt has never raced there, though. In fact, all five of his races have been in England. Number 11 is Polar Falcon, another European invader, trained by John Hammond, ridden by American Cash Asmussen, who's been the leading rider in France five times. Number 12, Val de Bois, raced in France last year, but in the U.S. under the care of Bobby Frankel in 1991. Comes from off the pace, had a rough trip at Santa Anita in his last start. Number 13, Jolie's Halo, one of the leaders in the new American Championship Racing Series early in the year. Racing mostly on dirty, hasn't won since March. He is two of three on the grass. And number 14 is Sultry Song, bred and owned by Charlotte and John Weber's Live Oak Plantation of Ocala, Florida. The cold winless in two starts on the grass. And that's the field for the mile. Greg McCarran, what do they look like warming up? Well, Tom, I'll tell you a little something about Shahadid. She's usually a little high strung in the paddock and in post parade. So all week long, they've been taking her out with the lead pony to try to settle it down some. And it seems to have worked a little. Even though she was high strung in the paddock, she seems to be going pretty good with her pony right now. And the other one I've been looking at is Kiyonga, is uh, because 21 year old uh, Willie O'Connor, you know, he's a rising star in Ireland and he's never ridden for a purse like this. And I'd like to know what, you know, his stomach is like right now. All right, Greg McCarran, the Breeders' Cup mile. Will the Europeans win another one? Will the Americans in excess or tight spot come away the winner? We'll be back with a race in a moment. Welcome back to Sports Weekend Control on what has been a momentous day for Canadian racing. More to come. And we'll have a full report from Jim Bannon on Dan Smartley's victory. He'll talk with Ernie Samuel and Jim Day. But right now, from Louisville, Jim Bannon's thoughts on the mile, which is the next race up. Brian, the million dollar mile goes around two turns on the turf and the Europeans have treated this race as their own private domain and they have a great representation again this year. Coming from Europe is Polar Falcon. He's the son of Nuriev and of course Nuriev has been represented by a couple of winners in this event already in Miesk. He has a very good chance but he has post 14. As for the others, Priola was unlucky to lose this race last year and he's back again hoping for better luck this time. And there's one more horse worth considering, and it's Tight Spot. That's America's best horse. He's eight for eight on the grass, and he's full of speed. All right, Jim, and Tight Spot switched from dirt to grass, undefeated since then in June of 1990. In case you missed it, a day to remember for Canadian racing. Dan Smartley winning the distaff. The 0 for 18 drought has ended for Canadian horses in the breeders. Still to come, Jim Bannon with a full report on the Samuels camp. Owner Ernie Samuel, trainer Jim Day. And, of course, Sky Classic, another Samson horse, is favored in the Turf Classic yet to come this afternoon. Sky Classic winning the Rothmans International a couple of weeks ago at Woodbine. Speaking of droughts ending, Sky Classic ended a long drought in the Rothmans International, becoming the first Canadian horse since he's a smoothie to win that in 1967. The big day continues as we go back live on this Saturday afternoon to Churchill Downs. <laughs> Can he win the mile and take Horse of the Year honors? Can Tight Spot remain unbeaten on the grass? They're both heading postward in the Breeders' Cup mile. And they'll face a potent group of European runners. In fact, 1991 is the biggest representation yet for the Europeans. Tom Durkin has analysis of that. Why have so many Europeans decided to come over this year for the Breeders' Cup? Tom? The Breeders' Cup Mile is indeed the most European race on the card this afternoon. For grade one, mile races on the grass in the United States are an oddity, but in Europe they're plentiful. And this year, the European Invasion Force is the strongest and the deepest in the eight-year history of this race. Six of these horses have proven themselves time and time again in grade one races at a mile on the grass. So with all of those opportunities over in Europe, why make the trip all the way across the Atlantic? Well, there's a few reasons, actually. The trainers in Europe feel that American turf racing is inferior, and they might be right. And, well, there's a million other reasons, and all of them have a picture of George Washington on the front. All right, all right, Tom Durkin. In excess, if he wins today, he's likely horse of the year. In fact, some say he may be horse of the year anyway. 
in excess going to the post. The leader, number seven there in your picture, in uh, the Horse of the Year balloting. And right now, uh, the fans like his chances, though he hasn't run on grass since December of 1990. He is the two to one favorite, two to one on in excess. Second choice at two and a half to one, the uh, tight spot, the horse that is eight for eight on the grass course. John Beach, do you think trainer Bruce Jackson ducked the classic to run on the mile and a chance to preserve horse of the year? Uh, without a doubt. Uh, he was between a rock and a hard place when he got here to Churchill Downs. He found very, very quickly that his horse didn't care for the dirt surface at all. Just uh, didn't agree with him and he didn't train well. And he was here. Uh, he had committed himself to be here. So uh, rather than it looked like he was ducking everybody, switched back to the turf where his horse had run successfully but quite a while ago. And he's got a very, very hard road to hoe today. This is a very top field. Of particularly uh, some of the horses from England, Ireland, and France are really top competitors, and they're used to this stall going. Remember, the European horses will face much tighter turns on this turf course here at Churchill Downs than they normally face in the big sweeping courses of Europe. So the Europeans had a bit of a disadvantage in that regard, but maybe with an advantage on the turf being a little soft, something the American runners haven't faced uh, very often in their careers. Breeders' Cup mile, let's go to Tom Durkin. Second set now taking his place in the starting gate and on the far outside, Bowler Falcon. Exceptionally strong field of milers this year, including two American Horse of the Year candidates. And they're off in excess, was off a beat slow, and Shada Yeed also missed the break toward the inside. It's the French filly, Danseuse de Soie. In excess is recovered now, and he's coming up after the lead, and Jolie's halo. So it will be in excess, who leads the way. He wins the race into the first turn, pushed all the way by Jolie's halo. Danseuse de Soie is right there. Shada Yeed is ranked toward the inside. Willie Carson doing his best to keep her inside. Kayunga, the Irish filly, is three wide opening first, now moves into fourth. Kayunga's fifth, and then Shada Yeed is a rank sixth and on the outside it's tight spot he's seventh and now he's called on for run he's moving up now within five lengths of the lead second set is following his move he's racing in seventh sultry song whipping steadily on the outside Priolo is down inside horses now about eight lengths from the front then star of cozine scan is near the back of the pack along with val dubois polar falcon is still unhurried the bulky field moving for the far turn the quarter 24 flat the half in 48 flat it is in excess tight spot confronts him now, tight spot and in excess in those two, and Jolie's halo is mixing up in between them, and the duel intensifies now as they round the fire turn, in excess bracing all out for the challenge, tight spot is right there, Jolie's halo still fighting it out, then Suze de Soie looking for a seam to run through toward the inside, opening verse is coming with his run now, Chaudier looking for running room, Priolo's in behind a wall of horses, Val Dubois passing the furlong pole, opening verse has now taken the lead, and that says the small moves through toward the inside. A late charge from Star of Cozine down to the wire now. Opening first. Yes! He pulls off the upset. And it's close for second Star of Cozine or Val de Bois. And the two uh, favorites here fail in the stretch, weakening each other with a duel around the fire turn. And it is opening verse under a rousing ride here by Pat Valenzuela, who pulls the upset off here at 25 to 1. 25 to 1 on opening verse in the colors of Alan Paulson and trained by Richard Lundy. This is a Kentucky bred coat, bred in Kentucky by Jacques Wimfeimer, sired by the minstrel who was champion on the grass in Europe. Opening verse set a course record at Churchill Downs this spring, winning the early times turf classic here. He loves this turf course out in the middle of it here and holding off the late chargers. Opening verse, the long shot winner of the Breeders' Cup mile. Here's our photo finish. Opening verse gets there just over a length, tight for second. And it is, it appears, Val de Bois just nosing out star of Cozine. That's unofficial on our NBC photo finish. Pat Valenzuela on opening verse. Another upset at the Breeders' Cup, this time in the mile. say he can win it despite being defeated in the mile but uh, it was opening versus day in the Breeders' Cup mile giving Pat Valenzuela his third Breeders' Cup win and uh, as you said Tom in excess and tight spots sort of cooked each other at this point and 
and uh, here is uh, NXS on the inside, tight spot right there on the outside, and those two dueled each other into the feet. It was that just off the pace style for opening verse that set up the victory here. He might not be horse of the year, but he's the horse for the course. The last time he won was here at Churchill Downs, setting a course record. And here he comes right on the outside, Pads Valenzuela getting after him. You can see some of the others will uh, gain some ground at the end, but they're just passing tired horses. And the two tiredest of them all were in excess and tight spot. Drifting out just a little bit, but that was okay. He got home clear and was very tight indeed for the second spot. Dan? Gary Stevens rode the favorite in excess. Gary, why don't you tell us about the trip? Well, he broke a little bit off stride, but he picked it up right away. He was on an easy lead. He was loping along nice, very comfortable all the way. He was handling the turf good. The turf's in good shape. Uh, they picked up the pace quite a bit going into the far turn, and my horse has got a good eighth of a mile in him, and uh, everybody started riding going into the turn, and uh, he mostly put his run in around the final turn and uh, not where the money's won at in the last eighth of a mile. So uh, really no excuse, just one of those days he didn't fire his best race. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, he's a great horse. He's one of the best horses I've ever ridden. I would have liked to win the day, but it didn't happen, and that's what makes horse racing. Thanks, Gary. And now let's go to Jenny with trainer Bruce Jackson. Bruce, uh, Gary also told you something about the going today. It's called firm, but ne not definitely firm. Gary said he bobbled a little bit on there, but he just got beat today. It looked at, uh, like it'd be a two-horse race at one point with tight spot, but then he sort of faded. Both those horses were up there in contention early, and they both faded late. You struggled for weeks over which race to put in excess in. You took the mile. What about you looking back on the hindsight on the decision? I wouldn't change it. it just I didn't feel they would do well on this track at a mile and a quarter. We went for the distance that we wanted to run him at, and that's why we, we took our chances. And some are saying you're still strong for horse of the year. What would I you think say? He's done plenty all year long. He's done more than any horse has done. Win four group ones in a row, set track records and stakes records. So I think we're very very tough right now. Thank you, Bruce Jackson. Let's go to Trevor Denman. In here with a jubilant Pat Valenzuela. You've won two Breeders' Cups before, Pat, but from a jockey's point of view, this was your greatest ride in the Breeders' Cup. Take us through it. Trevor, uh, he ran a very good race. He broke well. He was sitting behind the leaders the whole way. Tight spot moved up down the backside, and I knew he was going to go a little early, so I just was, was very pleased to sit behind him and entering the stretch. I angled him out, and he really responded well, Trevor. He finished very good. Any no problems out there for you in the race? None, none whatsoever. He ran super. And uh, I'd just like to say hi to my daughters, Michelle, Christine, Elizabeth, all my family in Arcadia, and uh, when my little brother here with me in uh, Churchill this year. He's 16 years old, Jamie Valenzuela. A very, very jubilant Pat Valenzuela out there. We might see you in here again a little later on, Pat. Congratulations on that terrific win out there for trainer Dick Lundy. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's go to Tom Hammond. And opening verse paying $55.40, $22.10, $60. Dubois just nosing out Star of Cozine for the second spot. Look at that exacta payoff. <laughs> $834.20 on the exacta. A happy ending for Pat Valenzuela, who's had his problems with uh, drug abuse, now has his life straightened out and gets his third Breeders' Cup win. Bob? All right, Tom Hammond, thank you very much. We have the presentation for the mile by Jay Schmidt, the re regional merchandising manager of Toyota Motor Distributors. On behalf of Toyota Motor Sales USA, I'm proud to present you the 1991 Breeders' Cup Award. Alan Paulson's the winner. Well, thank you. Uh, join this with my collection. He's had a few. He's going to have another shot with Arazi coming up in the juvenile. Congratulations to Dick Lundy, the entire clan. They're happy. Opening verse in the mile. All right, Bob, Arazi will be uh, wearing the Paulson colors in the race coming up. That's the Breeders' Cup, Juvenile's Cup Mile, opening verse at 25 to 1. Val de Bois, star of Cozine. And as you see, tight spot losing for the first time on turf, finishing 10th, and in excess coming home in the 9th position. Here's the morning line now for the next race, which is the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And it's been wide open in America and far for the juvenile division. Bertrando, 5-2, is the morning line favorite. Arazi from Europe at 3-1. So we're getting ready for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile up next to pick the favorite for next year's Kentucky Derby. Well, can you imagine the New York Yankees or the Boston Celtics folding? Well, it would have the same psychological impact to baseball and basketball fans as the bankruptcy of Calumet Farm had to racing fans. The impossible has happened. Why it happened is not easy to unravel. 1941. 
Holloway captures the Kentucky Derby and goes on to take the Triple Crown. Three years later, Pensive wins the Derby in Preakness and later sires the 1949 Derby winner Ponder. 1948, Citation wins the Triple Crown, the first thoroughbred millionaire. All these champions and many more wore the devil's red and blue of Calumet, products of America's foremost thoroughbred breeding and racing establishment. Beautiful Calumet has been the epitome of a thoroughbred breeding farm for over six decades. In the 40s and 50s, they dominated the American racing scene, topping the earnings list 12 times. No other farm has ever dominated horse racing like Calumet. How famous is Calumet? Just this past winter, the Ford Motor Company ran a commercial featuring the farm and their image as a model of American excellence. Ford in the 80s. And smart money will tell you, we're going to be even tougher to beat in the 90s. Like any good racehorse, bloodlines are important to Calumet, established as a thoroughbred farm by Warren Wright Sr. in 1931. He ran it until he passed away in 1950. And upon the death of his widow, Lucille Markey, the farm passed to Warren Sr.'s grandchildren. Since none were horsemen, one who was, Lucille Lundy's husband, J.T., took over as Calumet president. In 1982, when Lundy took over, the farm was debt-free and turning a profit, but not for long. His management style was a little different. He was an aggressive person. He didn't play according to the local rules of... of uh, the way some people think a genteel farm owner ought to act, but he did things his own way, and he, he knew what he was doing. Lundy changed the veteran management team within months of his takeover and spent massive amounts of money, even purchasing a private airplane. The farm underwent renovation and new capital construction, including an equine swimming pool. But the methods were paying off. Criminal type was 1990 Horse of the Year, and Calumet was honored as leading breeder. But behind the scenes, things were not well, and Lundy resigned, leaving the farm with debt in the neighborhood of $100 million. The Wright family called on John Ward to take over as president, but in a short period of time, Ward could do little to save the farm. And in July, to the shock of the industry, they filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. He panicked, I think. He kept saying, you know, we're going to hit a good one. All we need is two or three real good horses. And, and that last year, we had eight stakes stakes winners. I mean, you know, the, just coming along. But interest was piling up. And the banks were asking for money that we didn't have to scrape up. Bad management. And all. when you, you spend money for horses, it's not worth what you pay for them. And if they don't turn out anything, you're, going to, you're definitely going to go broke. The final blow had come last November when leading sire Alidar broke his leg in a stall accident and had to be destroyed. With Alidar died the millions of dollars worth of stud fees he brought to the farm yearly. The search for a buyer continues, but Calumet's future is now up to the legal system. Over $27 million in lawsuits having been filed by creditors. A dispersal of the farm's horses will take place at Keeneland tomorrow. And it may not be finally settled until years after the red gates close for the final time. For seven years, John Veach was the Calumet Farm trainer. In fact, trained the great Ali Dar. John, uh, what were your feelings when you first run, learned that uh, that Calumet was bankrupt? Well, a, a terrible feeling of disappointment. I'd, of course, been raised in the horse business, and Calumet had been like, the, as was said, the New York Yankees, something that was tradition and, and, and the backbone of racing. And But things happen, and the horses will be dispersed, and the land will probably be divided and sold. But as long as those names, the, the people will remember, Citation, Whirl Away, Bewitched, Twilight Tear, Aladar, the sounds like the battle cry of fallen heroes. People will remember Calumet, and there will always be a Calumet in, in, in racing. Do you have an opinion on, on how it all came about? Well, I'm sure that it was due to many things. Uh, the changing uh, situation in our economy, and certainly in the horse business, and certainly uh, some sort of mismanagement, I'm sure, was involved in overestimation of, of horses' values. Uh, it's uh, difficult to put the blame on anyone's shoulders, but I'm sure that uh, there are some people out there that, that the blame will fall very easily upon. Well, it's all in the legal system, as we said now. And Strike the Gold, who runs in the Classic today, a Calumet bred horse, one of the horses they had to sell. Pulled on by Ernie Samuel, came into prominence just 13 days ago when he beat a top international field in the Rothmans at Woodbine. It's Scotty Clausen, Bo Sultan, here comes Panoramic for Steve Cawthon. They're running out of ground. Sky Classic placed the flag. Canada's Sky Classic wins the Rothmans International. Panoramic second, Tottenham, a great race to finish third. Bo Sultan was... Rothmans was a mile and a half. The turf today is the same distance. And owner Ernie Samuel feels...
knows the turf is his best surface. Obviously, Sky Classic has now shown us that uh, that's where he wants to run. I mean, he was brilliant on the, the dirt as well as a younger horse, and at the moment, he seems to say that, uh, that he prefers the green stuff. And so I guess we'll leave him there if he keeps running like this. All right, $2 million Turf Classic comes up in about 46 minutes from now. Before that, though, let's go back live for the Juvenile. Winner of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile traditionally is the favorite for next year's Kentucky Derby here at Churchill Downs. Here's the way the fans uh, see the race going. Bertrando from California, 5-2 to two at the moment. Try to watch the New York Champagne winner, 5-1. to one. And uh, if we go down the line, Arazi is the 2-1 to one favorite. The horse from France, who has won six in a row, is the 2-1 to one favorite for his first race on dirt. Well, in the first race today, champion Housebuster was injured, suffering a non-life-threatening injury, soft tissue injury. And Trevor Denman has an update on his progress. We're standing here with veterinarian Dr. Owens. Doctor, good or bad news about Housebuster? Trevor, basically very good. Radiographs have all been examined. There are no fractures. He does have a tear in his suspensory ligament, and it's just a matter of time now to give him some recuperative time. Everything should come along to the best of his, uh, our ability now to get him healed up. Was it a little better than you thought originally, or was it pretty bad and then uh, got worse and then cleared up? Did you think it was going to be much what it was like right now when you first saw it? I think really that uh, the end result is that the, a tear in the suspensory ligament takes a long time. And when he left the racetrack, he walked off, uh, as you know, into the van himself, into the ambulance. And uh, we anticipate that it's going to be a rather short recovery period, considering the injury. A couple of months he'll be out? Well, I think so, yes. Well, that's very good news about Housebuster, and all that's left now is to wish him a very long and successful career at stud. Back to Tom Hammond. That's right, Trevor. He'll have a long time to get over that injury. This was scheduled to be his last race in any event. Well, it's interesting, uh, John Veach, to see that the fans have made Arazi the favorite. He's going to race on dirt for the first time. He's in the outside post position, and yet they think he's good enough. Well, there's no doubt that uh, part of that reason is that we really haven't had a standout uh, two-year-old in, in the East Coast or on the West Coast. We've had a couple that have run very well, but nothing has been very convincing. Uh, certainly the horse from California seems to be the best uh, for, that America has to offer, but Arazi has been absolutely brilliant uh, in Europe. I've talked to a fellow that uh, had watched him run a couple times and said that he probably could be as one, as one of the best two-year-olds that they've seen there in many, many years. So they're very, very keen on him, as they should be. Well, you know, we talk about horses being on dirt for the first time when they come over from Europe, but actually at Chantilly, where they train the horses in France, they do have some uh, dirt gallops, don't they? Oh, very much so. Almost all of these European horses have uh, those from England and Ireland, France, have all trained on the dirt. They train on the dirt more probably than they do on the turf. So it's an easy, easy uh, transition. Look at the goggles there on Showbrook. This is something unusual. Have you ever seen that? No, I've, I've, I've never seen what they would call goggles, uh, covers that used to cover eyes, uh, horses that had eye problems. But uh, these are apparently some sort of mesh to uh, keep the uh, dirt out. So it's uh, maybe it's an innovation, uh, but it, it certainly looks strange. <laughs> if you see that in the program, change of equipment, Showbrook goggles on. I don't know if I've ever, ever seen that in a program before. For the goggles on. There is a Razi as the Paulson colors again on the back of Pat Valenzuela, who looks for two wins in a row this Breeders' Cup day. Valenzuela in the Paulson colors, getting an opening verse home first at an upset in the Breeders' Cup mile. Horses making their way toward the racetrack now. Arazi, if he should have a good performance today, perhaps will stay in America and run in the Kentucky Derby next spring. Here are the horses for the juvenile, sponsored by Delta Airlines. Number one, Asian Corps, signed by Breeders' Cup juvenile winner Capote. He won Belmont's Futurity, but was beaten 45 lengths in the Champagne. Ridden by the former leading rider in Peru, Jorge Chavez, who's competed in the U.S. since 1988. Number two, Pine Bluff, owner John Ed Anthony of Loblolly Stable, names all his horses for Arkansas landmarks. Pine Bluff, the horse, hasn't yet reached landmark status, though, having won only a maiden race. Number three, try to watch races in the colors of 94-year-old Fred Hooper, whose first horse, Hoop Jr., won the Kentucky Derby here in 1945. Try to watch galloped away from the field in the Champagne, winning that one-mile test by seven and a half lengths. Number four, Bertrando, named for restaurant owner Bertrand Hoog of Rancho Santa Fe, California, and partly owned by trainer Bruce Headley's 15-year-old son, Gus. Sired by former Classic winner Skywalker, Bertrando is unbeaten in three starts, including a nine-length romp in Santa Anita's Norfolk Stakes. 
Number five is Showbrook. This Irish bred colt races in the U.S. for the first time. He has the goggles on. He's won four of eight in Europe. His trainer, Richard Hannon, a former drummer in a rock group, the Trogs. Number six star recruit, a $52,000 purchase this year by the Dandar Farm, a good investment. He's already earned over $200,000. Number seven is Snappy Landing, who was second in the Champagne for Frederick McNeary, county supervisor of Saratoga Springs, New York, site of America's oldest operating racetrack. Number eight is Bag, sired by Devil's Bag in a $67,000 purchase earlier this year. After winning a restricted stake at Fairplex in California, he was third in the Norfolk. Number nine, Big Sur, purchased by Wayne Lucas for $400,000 at the Keeneland Yearling Sale. He's a son of the late Ali Dar. Big Sur was winner of the Sapling Stakes at Monmouth Park. Number 10, Dance Floor, You Can't Touch This, could be the most popular song at the Downs if Hammer's Horse wins. The late developing Dance Floor has won two in a row, including Keeneland's Breeders' Futurity. Number 11, Arazi, the European champion two-year-old, bred by Buffalo Bills owner Ralph Wilson. The colt was purchased as a weanling by Alan Paulson for $350,000. When Paulson entered him in the Keeneland yearling sale, the bids weren't high enough, so he sent him to France to race. Now that he's reeled off six consecutive wins, the bids are high enough. Sheikh Mohammed just purchased half interest in Arazi for $5 million. And a good performance today could bring him back for the Derby. Number 12, Onlooker in the mutual field, trained by the legendary Woody Stevens. Now 78 years old, just a year after quadruple bypass surgery. One of the greatest trainers in the history of the sport. This colt broke his maiden at Belmont by 10 lengths. 13, Devil on Ice, fourth in the Champagne, ridden by Jose Santos, who has been aboard five Breeders' Cup winners, including Fly So Free in the Juvenile last year. Number 14 is Offbeat, owned by Denny Phipps, chairman of the Jockey Club, which officially registers all American thoroughbreds. This colt has only a maiden win to his credit. Greg McCarron once again on horseback out on the track, and what do you see from uh, these horses, including Arazi, who's on dirt for the first time, Greg? Well, Tom, I, I'm certainly going to pay attention to him because earlier this week, uh, Pat Valenzuela got an introduction to, him, introduction to him to try to get used to him, and unfortunately, he propped and wheeled and dropped Pat. So I see he's with a lead pony right now and probably will act all right, but he'll be watching in this post parade with all these people here. Yep. The other one I've been looking at is, the, is those goggles on, on uh, Showbrook, and I'm telling you, I, I don't know that they could possibly work without, you know, it looks like they would almost, if they get covered with dirt, blind them instead of help them see. All right, so Arazi continues to reign as the favorite. The fans think he can transfer his European form to the United States. Maybe he will be the favorite for next year's Kentucky Derby. Breeders' Cup Juvenile coming up in a moment. A post position, very quick run to that first turn, and then the long Churchill down stretch for the favorite to next year's Kentucky Derby. Can Arazi do it? Can the champion European two-year-old beat the Americans? Let's look at the top contenders for the juvenile. The hammer could be hopping if Dance Floor can do the trick in the juvenile. Owned by the family of rap star Hammer, Dance Floor is a colt who could be peaking at the right time. While he took four races to break his maiden, this D. Wayne Lucas trainee has now won two in a row at the mile and a sixteenth distance. The Breeders' Futurity was his opportunity to step up to a prominent position among two-year-old colts, and he ate it up. If he improved to the point of a victory in the juvenile, the Hammer clan could be dancing in the winner's circle. The leader from the New York area is Try to Watch. Owned by 94-year-old racing legend Fred Hooper, he aims to become the first gelding ever to win the juvenile. Sent off at 12 to 1 odds in his last start, he toyed with the field in Belmont Champagne Stakes. Is the field that weak, or is Try to Watch that good? We'll find out shortly. The West Coast standard among these juveniles is the undefeated Bertrando. A son of 1986 Breeders' Cup Classic winner Skywalker, he has dominated whatever competition he's faced in California. The Norfolk Stakes was his shining moment as he wired the field by nine lengths. But today he may face early challenges for the lead. And jockey Alex Solis will find out how Bertrando will respond to pressure. But the X factor in this race comes from France. Arazi is clearly the most accomplished and experienced horse in the field. But today he runs on dirt for the first time. 
Trainer Francois Boutin has guided Arazi to six wins in a row, including three Group 1s. His explosive stretch run in the Grand Criterium convinced Boutin to try a dirt surface in the Juvenile. If he wins today, he could remain in the stage to prepare for next year's Kentucky Derby. And the fans like Arazi, but they also like the unbeaten California horse Bertrando, now at 2-1. Two 2-1 to one. Two to one on Bertrando, the New York horse try to watch at 9-2. Dance Floor out of Keeneland, 9-2. And Arazi, 2-1 to one, co favorite now with Bertrando. There's Showbrook with those unique goggles. And in the saddle, the living legend Lester Piggott. Who uh, won on Royal Academy in the mile last year, one of the great stories of last year's Breeders' Cup. Can he do it again? Maybe the goggles will keep all the dirt from flying in the face, or at least bothering Showbrook when the dirt does fly in his face in this mile and a 16th test as the Europeans try the dirt course for the first time in their racing career. Six starters of the first seven races, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile have won Eclipse Awards as champion two-year-old Colt, and the Feet Pin Kai has ridden three juvenile winners. He's aboard Star Recruit, one of the long shots in this field. And again, Arazi will be in the outside post position. And Greg McCarran, if you're listening, what uh, challenge does that present for a jockey going into that first turn very quickly? Particularly when you are number 14, it's a large field. You want to get out of the gate real quick to try to get over some. And with these green two-year-olds, it can present a big problem if that horse, especially is not used to a left-handed turn like Arazi may not be. So it's, Pat, Pat's got his hands full, I'm sure. All right, let's go up to Tom Durkin for the call of the Million Dollar Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Six minutes from today, in six months, they'll run the Kentucky Derby for the 118th time over this course. This is the eighth Breeders' Cup Juvenile, and it will go a long way in picking the early favorite for this year's Derby. Two favorites here, Arazi and Bertrando, and indeed... It is Arazi who is a slight favorite as he takes his place in the starting gate. We're ready for the start in the juvenile and they're off. And Bertrando comes out running. Agincourt is right there. And on the outside, it's Star Recruit. But it is Bertrando, Alex Solis, intent on the lead. And he wins the race into the first turn. He's there by a length and a half. Star Recruit in bag and post pursuit. Agincourt saving ground all the way. Devil on ice was five rides, rounding the first turn. Showbrook is now racing sixth in between horses. Pine Bluff is under a firm hold at the inside, racing seventh. Big Sur is eighth on the outside. Onlooker is ninth. Try to watch is tenth. He's about ten lengths off the lead, and he's launching a bid now from the back of the pack, and it's dance floor farther back. Snappy landing, and Arazi, the European star, is a dozen lengths from the front as offbeat trails the field as they continue midway down the back stretch. Bertrando coasting on an uncontested lead, and he's moving at a quick pace. The quarter in 23 and 1. He gets a half in 46 and three fifths seconds. It is still Bertrando out there unchallenged. He leads by two. Long shot Agincourt still chasing second. Pine Bluff is only three lengths for the lead. Arazi hits his best stride, and there goes the European star Arazi, and he's coming with a menacing rush to Bertrando. And now the stage is set as they move toward the top of the stretch, and Arazi runs right by him. Arazi with a dramatic move as the field turns for home. He's wide into the stretch. Bertrando stunned at the inside with the move here of Arazi and he's pouring it on just incredible move as they come to the top of the stretch by four now and then it's Bertrando who is now a discouraged second by the back it is snappy landing and they're coming down to the finish here here indeed is a superstar Arazi absolutely brilliant he was taken under a hard hold to win it here by five and he could have won by ten perhaps and Bertrando was second absolutely sensational what a race and what a horse the best in the world the biggest winning margin in the history of the breeders cup juvenile and he did it with ease can a two-year-old be horse of the year arazi now has won seven in a row and wears the crown as the best two-year-old in all the world what a move he looks like a $10 million horse off that run. Arazi, in the colors of Alan Paulson and co-owned by Sheikh Mohammed, trained by Frenchman Francois Bouton. Arazi, a son of blushing groom, bred in Kentucky by Ralph Wilson, Jr., and what a move he put on. 
Down the back stretch, Pat Valenzuela had only one horse beat. Suddenly, he asked Arazi to go, and he turned on the afterburners. Arazi, with a brilliant move, he's just running by horses like they're tied to a post. Look at Arazi now to the outside. Bertrando had made an easy lead, was going along in stride, and Arazi just blew by. And the horse, John Veach, down the stretch, didn't appear to change leads. Usually, a horse will change leads and get a little burst of energy down the stretch. He didn't even need that. and just was so well in command of the race and uh, actually a hand ride the jock is shaking his stick at him but it, it's more to do have something to do with his hands just rather than just holding on Arazi with a brilliant performance in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile when's the last time you saw a two-year-old that good he will be the favorite for anybody's derby anywhere in the world The crowd at Churchill Downs still a buzz over the performance of Arazi. No winner of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile has ever taken the Kentucky Derby, but as Pat Valenzuela came back toward the winner's circle, he yelled at us, Derby winner, 1992. Tom Durkin, a tremendous performance. A tremendous off-the-pace performance, and here's how far off the pace he was. At this point in the race, with six furlongs to go, he was better than 15 lengths off the lead. He's well back in the pack as they continue the run down the back stretch, and he just threads his way through in between horses. Bertrando really had no excuse. The pace was pretty solid, but he was coasting uncontested all the way. There's Bertrando out in front now, and yet to see where the eventual winner comes from at this point. There he is on the outside, now beginning to make his move. He's threading his way through in between horses, uh, like Red Grange going through so many would-be tacklers. With three furlongs to run, he was still well out of it, and now he makes this electrifying move. There he is, right there on the outside, making an electrifying move, and he will run right by Bertrando. So often you see a real good two-year-old, and you want to think, is this the next secretariat? Well, maybe, just maybe, he might be. No two-year-old has ever accomplished so much. This could be racing's next superstar. He came a little bit wide into the stretch, but please do note, although he is on the wrong lead here, that this horse had never run on a left-handed turning track. He'd been running on straights and right-handed tracks in Europe, and it's pretty understandable that he was just a bit awkward going this way. Let's go down to Dan. Well, we're here with Bruce Headley and Bruce you Saddle, what may have been the best two-year-old in America this year, but maybe not good enough to beat a horse like a rod. Well, uh, we ran against the best horse in the world today. He looked like a monster, like uh, Secretary or Swap. He's really a great horse. Well, thank you, and let's now go over to Trevor Denman. Well, I wish I could be under a more pleasant circumstances. Alex, second time today we've been in the second box here. Tell us about Bertrando. You look like you were going well out there. What happened around about the quarter pole? Well, he was going real easy uh, around the... Uh, 16 I saw a horse coming and I asked my horse to go and he, re he, <coughs> he responded very strong um, all of a sudden I see that horse w w blew by me uh, my horse was running real hard nobody was going to beat the winner today he was just absolutely awesome thanks Alex let's go down to Jenny Pat Valenzuela what does it feel like to ride a horse that goes so fast it looks like everybody else stopped well to tell you the truth I was easing him up, easing him up the last uh, 60 yards in the race and he was just he's a tremendous he has a tremendous turn of foot he's a very good horse I think I think if I'm if I'm correct I think he's a derby winner of 92 I sure hope so take a look at him on the monitor here Pat uh, we'll take a look at you weaving through traffic toward the early portions he didn't break too alertly was he just kind of green well they didn't want me to break him too sharp because they'd, scare, they'd be scared he'd be too lame too coarse but right here he's just dragging me to the lead I mean he's, he's, a, he's a very good horse I, 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 I've never been on a two-year-old this good He's on the wrong way. Very good horse, yeah. exactly. Is this your derby mount, Pat? You bet. This is this horse I can almost guarantee you will win the Kentucky Derby. A little bit of a cut on his left hind foot, just a little green missing action. He's just a little green, and he uh, might have nicked himself going by horses, but uh, he, he's just such a nice horse, and I really want to thank Mr. and Mrs. Paulson for letting me ride this horse. They put me on two winners today, and... Uh, Indeed, you've had a really, wonderful day, Pat. Very Congratulations, a stunning win. Let's get those official prices, Tom. All right, Jenny, it's uh, scary to think that he can get better. <laughs> he gets uh, more experience with American racing. Arazi paying 620, 480, and 480. Bertrando, the early pace setter, second. Snappy Landing was third. 2260, the exacta. Bob Newmeyer with the presentation. Only appropriate, Tom Hammond, that we have from Delta Airlines, Wood Hawkins, the president and chief operating 
officer to present the trophy for the juvenile to a gentleman that's in the jet business, and now we know he has a jet for a racehorse. Oh, I, I tell you, this is a great day for thoroughbred racing, a great day for aviation. Congratulations, Alan, and uh, good luck. Maybe we'll see you back here in May. Will you run the horse in the Kentucky Derby back here the first Saturday in May? Oh, the way it looks now, I'd say for sure, but uh, we'll have to see. You know, May's a long ways away, and I'm, I'm sure he'll be in perfect shape. You know, this horse is just unbelievable. And in fact, he's won, this is the seventh stake race in a row. And for a two-year-old, he, he should be the horse of the year for sure. We should acknowledge that Sheikh Mohammed is also have, has an interest in this horse. You told me when you left the previous race, this was the one you wanted to prove that this was the super horse that you believed he was. That's for sure, and he proved it. I'm, I'm sure everybody will confirm that. Please bring him back to Churchill in May. Thanks well, a lot. I'm sure we will. All right, Alan Paulson with Francois Boutin. The trainer did a great job, and uh, what a horse, Arati. Let's go back to Tom. Maybe the five million dollars Sheikh Mohammed paid for half wasn't enough after that performance by Arazi today. What a race. We'll be back to Turkey. With a sweeping move on the outside is coming toward the lead. Grand Girlfriend also kicks in. Queen is coming hard on the extreme outside now as the field comes down toward the final furlong. Brought to mind with a short lead. Dance Smartly is right there on the outside. Fit for a queen. Brave at the rail third. Here comes Versailles. Treaty was kicking in late. But it is Dance Smartly she takes the lead under Pat Day's urging and pulls away here by two. It is Versailles Treaty, but it's too late and not enough. And it is Dance Smartly who strides under the line, undefeated this year, and the undisputed queen of racing on this continent. No doubt about it, Dan Smartley, the first Canadian horse to win a Breeders' Cup event. Jim Bannon reported that one of her foot bandages was actually severed when she was nicked by another horse. So Dan Smartley, fortunate not to be injured in winning the distaff. Now, she's trained by Jim Day for Ernie Samuel. They also have the favorite coming up in the Turf Classic. And earlier this morning, Jim Day had a chance to speak with Jim Bannon. Just hours away from Sky Classic's big race. Of course, he's in the mile and a half turf, $2 million on the line. Comes off a nice win in the Rothmans. How has he progressed from that race to the Breeders' Cup, Jim? Hopefully, Jim Sky Classic will be a little bit more settled here for the Breeders' Cup turf than he was at the Rothmans. The Rothmans, he was very fresh and very sharp and probably a little bit overtrained. And he was just, you know, almost too, too sharp to be at his best going a mile and a half. But I think that race will have done us some good. He's had some time now to get here and, and become well settled at Churchill Downs. And he seems very well of himself and sharp and in good shape. And I think he'll. Uh, run well but you know it should run a, a steadier race than he did in the Rothmans. Now he has the um, the hedge for a post position how is that? I think that's perfect it's, he's right on the inside he's got the shortest way around the course and uh, that should be the, the right spot to be. Well, Brian all that can be done has been done it's up to the horse now. It is indeed Jim and he is the first Canadian bred since he's a smoothie in 1967 to win the Rothmans he's favored in the turf as we take you back live to Churchill Downs in Louisville. Churchill Downs, the first Saturday in May. Will Arazi be here? For well over a hundred years, this track has hosted the world's most famous race. And here's the first live telecast of the Kentucky Derby. Honda's win in 1949, televised by NBC affiliate WAVE. The Kentucky Derby. Will Arazi add his name to the list of winners that circles the racetrack when he runs, we hope, in 1992. Stunning race by Arazi to win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile as you look at the complete order of finish in the race. Try to watch, who had been so brilliant in the champagne, can only manage an eighth place finish. And coming up, we'll have the Breeders' Cup Turf. Again, a strong event for the European horses. And uh, the morning line odds have Sky Classic from Canada at 5-2. to two. Solar Splendor has been scratched. And as we see the others on the morning line, Pigeon Voyageur from French, from France, and uh, all double figure odds on the morning line. A uh, wide open field as we've seen all afternoon. Well, two of the biggest stories of the racing year involve famous jockeys. For them, a year of triumph and tragedy. Angel Cordero passed a career milestone, but the thoughts of everyone in racing went out to the sport's greatest jockey, Bill Shoemaker, paralyzed after an automobile accident. The shoe had begun a training career, but who could forget his many stirring rides, some of them here at Churchill Downs. 
the shoe first made his presence felt here by riding swaps to victory in the 55 Kentucky Derby. But one of his greatest victories would be this Breeders' Cup Classic 32 years later. Shoemaker would later retire as a jockey, perhaps the sport's greatest, with over 8,800 wins. Now his life as a trainer is much different than he envisioned, but he's pacing it with typical shoemaker courage. I can't get on him anymore, but uh, if I'm going to get my people, uh, exercise boards are going to have to learn how I like to have them work and what to do with them. Uh, and if they don't, I'm going to have to get somebody else. I always felt that I could, I could win the battle and someday I'll be, I'll get my arms back and hopefully I'll get my legs back. Be walking up and down the track with the horses again. Yes, jockeys are familiar with courage. Angel Cordero has demonstrated it too. But racing under the spires on Breeders' Cup Day 88 brought a continuous smile to his face with back-to-back -back wins. It also brought him closer to this racing milestone. He's going to hold on. Classic Cordero, wire to wire, don't cross the law, does it? Number 7,000 for Angel Cordero Jr. Angel joined Bill Shoemaker and Lafitte Pinkai in the exclusive 7,000 win fraternity. And John Veach, a couple of riders that have ridden many horses for you, and uh, two men of great, two men of great courage, and uh, Bill Shoemaker. What a comeback he is having no. right now, and uh, it's really uh, heartwarming to see him on the road back. It is very much so. A man of of, of great brilliance, uh, tactician, uh, man of of great hands, able to to get more out of a racehorse with his hands than anybody else I've ever been able to, to that I've ever seen. And not only that, but a, a gentleman and and a, a true sportsman. But I'll say one thing about him. He's a tough little fella. He really is. He's a, he's a man all the way. Tough, that tough mindedness that made him a great jockey and has helped him come back from this tragedy. And there's no doubt in my mind that he'll be out there putting out winners with the rest of us trainers. And our best wishes to Bill Shoemaker, I'm sure, watching in California. Well, Unbridled has a date in the Classic later today. He could come become the first two-time winner of the Breeders' Cup Classic. Introducing a car that will actually change the road as you know it. A car that will command the road as impressively as it commands your attention. A car that offers you a new vision and design. Performance. Space. Introducing the all-new Toyota Camry for 1992. Camry, it will change the road forever. Toyota, proud sponsor of Canada's Olympic teams. Soup's on at Tim Hortons. So come on in for a super deal on our great selection of savory soups. You've always got time, always got time for Tim Hortons. Enjoy one of our soups with a tea biscuit, coffee, and a donut for just $2.99. Or a heartwarming bowl of chili with coffee, donut, and a tea biscuit for $3.49. Always got time for Tim Hortons. Soup's on, chili's hot. My classic looks absolutely great out there as well, and who knows, Jim Day could make it a great day for him and a great day for Canada here this afternoon. They just might go home with two winners. Sky Classic looking impeccable, getting the last-minute adjustments done to him here. He was very calm earlier on, but you can see now that he's starting to know that race time is just around the corner, and you can see Sky Classic loosening up, and he's really looking good out here. Pat Day will be the rider. Sky Classic really on uh, top of his game in the Rothmans uh, a few weeks ago, and already we've seen Dan Smartly from the Samson Farm and from trainer Jim Day's stable uh, come on with a victory, and the flag of Canada could be in the winner's circle once again. Jim Day, we understand, is free now, having saddled Sky Classic, and is back with Trevor. Here we are once again. Jim Day put, finished putting the saddle on Sky Classic right now. Jim, how does he feel out there? Well, I think he feels really, really good. He's acting very composed. Sometimes he can be a little fractious in the paddock, but uh, I would say today he's been as cool as ice, so hopefully uh, he'll run well. The crowd going to bother him out here? I don't think so. He's, he's come over very composed and very much within himself, so 
I think as long as he's cool now, I, don't, I think he'll stay good. We have the advantage now of having seen a race on the turf here. Any consternation about the condition of the turf course out there? No, I think the turf course is probably in very good shape. It's got a little bit of give in it, which is probably is fine for everyone. I think it's probably very fair and uh, probably suits horses to come from a little bit off the pace. Instructions to Pat Day, sit back early. I think the instructions would be to Pat is right on like he owns them. And we trust Pat's judgment and uh, he'll sort things out, I think, as he best sees fit. Traffic out there going to be a problem? You going to let Pat just scrape paint or do you think he'll come wide? I'm not sure. We'll have to leave that in Pat's hands. He's the director right now, so uh, it's all in his hands right now. Well, congratulations on your win earlier on and who knows, you might make it too right here. Thanks very much for being with us. Now let's go back upstairs. Okay, Trevor, I think the key word in that conversation was ice, which is about what our feet feel like here at Churchill Downs these days. Sky Classic, uh, saddled by Jim Day, who won a gold medal in the equestrian events for Canada at the Mexico City Olympics. An all-round horseman who really is having a fantastic year and already has that one Breeders' Cup win under his belt when Dan Smartly took the distaff. And uh, we'll see here Steve Cawthon and Cash Asmussen, two American jockeys that have gone overseas to have tremendous success after he rode a firm to the Triple Crown in 78. At the expense of John Veach trained Alidar, Cawthon went to Europe, and over a decade later, he is one of the leading riders in the world, has several times been champion jockey in England, and uh, is close to home here. Walton, Kentucky is his home, so he returns to Churchill Downs for one of the rare times in his career, and he will be aboard in the groove in today's race. And there is Cawthon getting a leg up from trainer David Ellsworth on In the Groove. Cawthon has won just about every major race in the world. The Arc de Triomphe has escaped him, and a Breeders' Cup win has escaped him. Other than that, he has won uh, the Kentucky Derby, the Epsom Derby, the French Derby, the Irish Derby. And this would be another feather in his cap should he capture the Breeders' Cup turf on In the Groove. And the horses are coming on the track for the Breeders' Cup Turf, which is sponsored by Budweiser. Number one is Sky Classic, who has won six in a row, including his only start on Churchill Downs Turf. He beat an international field over a mile and a half in the Rothmans. Number two, Philago. This colt has thrived since leaving Europe this year and coming to Bobby Frankel's barn. The former king of the claimers, Brooklyn-born Frankel, has a shot at an Eclipse Award as leading trainer. Philago comes off a win at this distance at Santa Anita. Number three, Quest for Fame, won the 1990 Epsom Derby for Prince Khaled Abdullah, a member of the royal family of Saudi Arabia. The problem is, he hasn't won a race in five outings since then. Number four, Pistole Blue, Daniel Wildenstein's Colt, has won five of seven lifetime starts, but one of his most impressive races was a loss, a third in the Arc de Triomphe, where he made a strong move in the middle of the race. Ridden by Dominique Buff, one of the new generation of French jockeys that ride in the American style. Number five, El Senor, now seven years old and nearing the end of his career. He was ninth in the arc, named for Hall of Fame trainer Senor Horatio Luro, grandfather of owner and trainer Billy Rice. Number six, Solar Splendor, was scratched. Number seven, it's all Greek to me, America's champion grass horse after finishing second in the mile last year. After a seventh place finish in the Arlington Million, it was determined he had a displaced soft palate, and after treatment, he equaled a course record at Keeneland. Number eight, Pigeon Voyageur. Trainer Andre Fab is qualified to practice law in France, but he practices horsemanship instead. He's been leading trainer the last four years. Bob's in the wings, won the turf last year. With a rough trip, Pigeon Voyageur closed well to be fifth in the arc. Number nine, Cartagena. The Aga Khan, a spiritual leader of some 23 million Ismaili Muslims and makes significant contributions to social and economic development in the third world. He's also one of the world's most successful thoroughbred owners and breeders. His filly Cartagena was third to Tight Spot and to Falago in her only two U.S. starts. Number 10, In the Groove, a hard-knocking four-year-old filly who has raced exclusively against the boys this year. Transplanted Kentuckian Steve Cawthon in the saddle for this race. He's O for the Breeders' Cup. Number 11 is Dear Doctor, another transplanted American, Cash Asmussen, now in France, rides Dear Doctor, who is a transplanted French-bred horse, now racing in America with two strong seconds at Belmont. Number 12 is Tanganyika, the first of three mutual field horses, ridden for the first time by Angel Cordero. The fairly has uh, one win and 12 starts in France. Number 13 is Saddler's Hall, Irish and English campaign, trained by Michael Stout. And number 14, Miss Alleged, who is winless this year and was 11th in the Arc de Triomphe, 5th in the Budweiser International. 
And Greg McCarran, what do you see from the horses now on the track? Well, Tom, from what I was told, Pistolo Blur was supposed to wash out real bad in the paddock. And I don't know if it's the cool weather or not, but he looked absolutely great. And when he broke off with the pony, he was raring to go. Another horse that I, I want to watch anyway is El Senor. Um, from what I understand, I talked to Billy Wright earlier this week, and he said his horse didn't get a chance enough to warm up in France in the arc. And he's hoping that the better warm-up today will give his horse a much better chance. He lagged far behind in the arc, and he thought it was due because he didn't get to warm up enough. Steve Cawthon on in the groove, hoping for a win at the Breeders' Cup. Strong field of 14, set to go to the post. And a half, the classic European distance. One of the reasons the Europeans fare so well in this event. They'll make that circuit of the grass course and select the international champion in the Breeders' Cup turf. There's an update on the odds now. Three to one on Sky Classic out of Canada. Pistolet Blue getting a lot of support after a third in the arc. He is five to two. Four to one on It's All Greek to Me, the defending grass champion. Pigeon Voyager, 17 to one. Cartagena, six to one. And uh, the odds reflecting a wide open race. John Beach, you told me that you thought Sky Classic had been at the top of his game in the Rothmans. No, without a doubt, uh, Tom. He, he was absolutely super up there. He trained good for the race. He looked great. Uh, uh, he, he ran a magnificent race. Uh, I did notice in the arc, though, that Festival Blue was uh, led quite quite a bit of the way and seemed to use himself or herself up uh, you know before it was absolutely necessary so uh, with a little bit of conserving uh, her strength uh, we might see a, uh, a different outcome than what happened in the arc Pistolet Blue is there you had a brief shot a moment ago of uh, Festine in his stall getting ready for the classic which will be up next putting the finishing touches on him getting ready to bring him over at the conclusion of this turf race He's a, uh, probably the standout in the, uh, in the Classic this year. Of course, we've had two defections of, of very useful horses, uh, and uh, he could really establish himself. Here are the past winners of the Breeders' Cup turf, which has had the closest finishes of any of the races on the championship program. These seven races decided by a total of two and a half lengths over the first seven runnings. Pigeon Voyageur comes out of the Arc de Triomphe. No ARC winner has won a Breeders' Cup race, but horses that have finished up the track in the ARC traditionally run well on Breeders' Cup Day. That's, that's quite true. Uh, you know, the thing about the, the turf this year, as I said earlier, is that uh, I think that the Europeans will have a distinct advantage. Most of the American horses and the Canadian horse have, have made the, their best run on, uh, on what you call uh, hard ground. A lot of them like to hear over. Uh, he seems to be returning to the form that he showed last year when he was champion. Uh, of course, El Senor runs very well on a very soft course, which he showed in New York the last time he ran. Maybe uh, what Billy Wright was said was true, that he didn't have the opportunity to warm up at the arc as he should have and uh, didn't have the early foot that he could have shown, although he, he tendency is always to come from behind. You can see the big uh, almost white horse now, El Senor, at the back of the pack in the early part of the race. The Breeders' Cup turf oh, over a mile and a half. The first is $2 million. Oh, God, Tom Durkin with a call. Final horses moving into line. Fighting Steve Cawthon taking his spot here as he returns to Churchill Downs. Aboard in the groove. Miss Alleged is moving in. The final horse into line will be Dear Doctor. Ridden by another American jockey. Now rides in Europe, Cash Asmussen, who had a great victory in the Arc de Triomphe. Ready to go, and they are off immediately. It's all Greek to me. Bounds right to the front. Quest for Fame is also right there. Pistolet Blue and closest to the inside, Sky Classic. Miss Alleged is five wide, moving for the fire turn. Cartagena is running along in sixth position now. Then down on the inside, Sadler's Hall is racing seventh. Pigeon Voyager is racing in eighth position. Deer Doctor is four wide, racing in ninth. And it's in the groove. She's racing tenth in behind horses. And Polago is now running about ten lengths from the front, unhurried in the early going. And there's a gap of three back to the late running, long striding El Senor. Saganica trails the turf field as they turn for home with Canadian Sky Classic leading the way. But he is prompted on the outside by last year's turf champion It's All Greek to Me. English Derby winner Quest for Fame tucked neatly in behind the front runner and Pistolet Bo. He's got a very good position early. He's running along and he's moving smoothly in fourth. Part of John is fifth and Miss Alleg and Sadler's Hall toward the inside. Pigeon Voyager Polago is down inside horses. He's about eight lengths from the front. The 
pace is sedate. 25 flat for the quarter. They've run a half mile in 50 and 4 fifth seconds. So Sky Classic moving comfortably with it's all Greek to me. Quest for Fame tucked neatly in behind them. Nestled at the rail in third position. Pistolet Blue still moving smoothly on the outside. Then Cartagena missile edge toward the rail. Pigeon Voyagers on the outside. And then farther back in the field, it's Pelago. He'll have a lot of running to do now. He's eight lengths from the front and he's pinned down inside in the groove who's under the firm grasp of Steve Cawthon. And on the far outside, Dear Doctor with Cash Asmussen. Far back trailing now, El Senor. He's better than 15 lengths from the front. And Saganica. They've run three quarters of a mile in 15 and four. And now, less than a half mile left in this Breeders' Cup turf. Sky Classic has been prompted the whole way by its all Greek to me. Quest for Fame has had a perfect trip. Pistolet Blue still waiting patiently to make his move. Cartagena, then Missile Edge. On the outside, Pigeon Voyager. Then toward the inside, Sadler's Hall. El Senor is picking off horses on the far outside. And Falago has dropped out of it. And the field turns for home now. The stage is set for the stretch drive. It's all Greek to me. Powers to a short lead. Sky Classic trying to battle back right there toward the inside. It's all Greek to me. Quest for fame is charging hard. Pistol A Blue not doing enough here. And Missile Ledge. Missile Ledge is flying down the center of the course. It's all Greek to me. Desperately trying to hold. And Missile Ledge pulls up another shocker here on Breeders' Cup Day 1991. Just another day and another upset here. It's all Greek to me with second as Missile Ledge wins the turf at a big, big price. <laughs> That's been the order of the day. Yeah, I don't know who's going to hit that pick seven. It may take three winners to, to take a winning pick seven ticket today after the upsets we've seen. Miss Alleged has not won in 1991 prior to this race. She was 11th in the Arc de Triomphe. She was 5th in the Budweiser International. But young Frenchman Eric Legree set her to the middle of the turf course, and she was flying at the end. It appeared that it's all Greek to me was going to be home, but Miss Alleged coming on at 40 to 1 just to uh, win the race. This is Filago. Filago uh, injured in the race and now being uh, unfortunately loaded into that equine ambulance. Right front. An injury to the right front leg apparently on Filago. But there is your winner, Miss Alleged. She beats the boys. Racing in the colors of the Fairs Farm of Issam Fairs, trained by Pascal Barry. This is a Kentucky bred filly by Alleged out of Miss Tusculum by Bold Nesian. Now here's a look at Filago, who is number two on the rail right here, ridden by Pat Valenzuela. And right there, takes a bad step, and Valenzuela, sensing that, begins to pull him up, not wanting to risk further injury. So Valenzuela pulling up Filago, who is being loaded into the equine ambulance. And Miss Alleged, the winner, it's all Greek to me. Last year, Royal Academy just beat him in the mile. This year, it's the turf in which he's second. Quest for Fame is third. Jenny Ornstein has a report on the injured horse, Filago. Well, I've just spoken with jockey Pat Valenzuela, who's uh, headed back to the jockey's room. He thought that Palago had fractured a sesamoid. That's a bone in the back of the ankle. It was just his assessment as he uh, pulled him up and stepped off of him at about the quarter pole. We'll try to get an update on Palago for you, but we do believe it is a broken bone in his ankle. Back to you, Tom. All right, Jenny. There is Palago being pulled up by Pat Valenzuela after he took that bad step. Valenzuela dismounting and waiting for the ambulance to come get Falago. Trevor Denman has a report. Well, I'm standing here with probably the unluckiest man in American racing right now. It's trainer Wally DeLarcy. Second last year with It's All Greek to me. Second again this year. Second in the Arlington Million. When is your turn going to come? Well, all these seconds are going to turn around one day. I, I'm real pleased to be second in a race like this. I'm very proud of my horse. He had to take the lead. Uh, George said he had so much horse at the top of the stretch, he had to go the lead early, and uh, there was nothing to run at. In these mile-and-a-half races, this is the situation. You've got nothing to run at, and he likes to run out another horse, and uh, another horse just beat him, but uh, he ran a very good race. Well, certainly was a great training job as well. Bad luck, Wally DeLarcy. Your turn's got to come. Let's go now to Tom Durkin. No apparent excuses for the front runners. Uh, it's all Greek to me, and uh, here is... Uh, the eventual winner, Miss Alleged. She had a pretty good trip, about five lengths most of the way around the racetrack, and then 
the jock tips off cover. Here comes uh, Eric Legree with Miss Alleged. She comes storing past horses that have beat her before. Pistole Blue has beaten her earlier uh, in his career, and now she comes. We have a phrase for races like this in New York when a horse wins like this. It says, go figure. Tom? <laughs> Tom, she had been injured prior to the running of the Arc de Triomphe last year, and they said she'd never been the same since that injury, but she looked like her old self there. Jenny? Jorge Velasquez wrote, it's all Greek to me. It's kind of a very moderate pace. We thought she'd last up there on the lead. He ran a hell of a race, you know. He was relaxing all the way, and uh, I had plenty of horse on the knee, and uh, as you can see, turning for home, I let him go, and he opened up, and he was running. He wasn't stopping. The other horse came stronger than him in the, in the last part, and that was it. But uh, I'm happy that he ran a good race. He was well trained for the race. The soft palate problems all better. Just a better horse beat him? I believe a better horse today beat him. All right, thank you, Jorge. Right now to Dan Kenny. Winning trainer Pascal Barry and uh, winning jockey Eric Legree are here, and Pascal will translate a brilliant ride closing behind a very yes. slow pace. Yes, very brilliant ride because he had a bad number in the soul, but the filly start very well, and he can keep her just behind the leader. She has a, she, he rode a terrific race. Now, <laughs> let Eric talk, uh, describe uh, his winning ride. Uh, en traduisant, oui, j'ai eu une très très bonne course. Yes. I have a very good race. I'm uh, following the five position, and uh, I'm I'm win very easy. <laughs> a very easy win. Viva la France, Tom Hammond, with the official results. I understood them perfectly, Dan. It was you that I was uh, struggling with there. There is Miss Alleged as we look at the official results in the Breeders' Cup turf. <laughs> 86-20. The pick seven today is going to be unreal. If anyone has a winning ticket, there may be none. <laughs> it's all Greek to me, second. Quest for fame, third. And another hefty exacta. Bob Neumeyer with a trophy presentation. All right, Tom Hammond, the international flavor continues here at Churchill Downs. A gentleman from Lebanon, Ekuri Farris, is the owner of Miss Alleged. And to make the trophy presentation, Michael Rorty of the Anheuser Busch Company. He's the executive vice president. So let's, uh, Mr. Farris, congratulations. Mike? Mr. Farris, on behalf of Budweiser, we thank you for making this such an exciting day and such an exciting race for us. So we are proud to give you this Budweiser trophy for running the best race of the day. I'm very grateful to Budweiser for supporting the, 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 the racing industry. You are very, very kind. Thank you very, very much. All right, gentlemen, we also have a second award, which is the Budweiser Breeders' Cup Trophy. It's given to the representative of the winning country. That's Bertrand Dubray, the president of the French Jockey Club, the winner, of course, misalleged from France. Michael? Yeah. Yes, congratulations. Mr. Uh, Dubray, yeah, very congratulations. Louis, uh, once again, we you. see you here. We're happy to be time. back. We hope we will be there next year again. Yeah, yeah, so thank good. you. Good Spell that with Budweiser, Lord. <laughs> I'm sure they will, and Mrs. Watson here as well. Happy scene here. First for the U.S., and then two French winners, Arazi and Miss Alleged. Arazi, of course, trained in France, though he is a Kentucky bred, as is Miss Alleged. Here's a complete order of finish in the Breeders' Cup turf. Another upset, Miss Alleged. Over It's All Greek to Me and Quest for Fame, the Derby winner. Sky Classic could manage only a fourth. And Pistole Blue, who drew a lot of attraction in the Mutuals, only a fifth place finish. El Senor, still plugging away, came home ninth. Now the morning line for the world's richest race, the $3 million Breeders' Cup Classic. Summer Squall at 4-1. Festine, the favorite on the morning line at 3-1. to one. Mike Battaglia's line, of course, had to be adjusted when in excess went from the Classic to the Mile, leaving Festine as the 3-1 to one favorite. Unbridled at 5-1, to one, trying to win back-to-back -back Classics. Black Tie Affair, the Cinderella Horse, 5-1. to one. Twilight Agenda is 6-1. to one. Well, this year's Breeders' Cup Classic, as you look at Festine, doesn't have a Sunday silence or easy go rivalry, but it does have a wide-open competitive field that is a handicapper's dilemma. Dawn has broken over the Twin Spires on many big race days, but rarely on a field with as much quality depth as this year's Classic. Even the loss of Farm Away, now sidelined by injury, fails to diminish the quality of the Classic field. 
The points winner in the new American Championship Racing Series, Farm Away, succumbed to an ankle injury. Given the magnitude of the race and that he would probably be favored if he was going to go in that particular uh, race, the Classic, and we had a $360,000 entry fee and a national pick seven to contend with, we just thought that maybe there were, there were too many variables to, to consider and we just decided to stay out. The horse to catch will likely be black tie affair with natural speed and the ability to carry it up to a mile and a quarter. Black Tie Affair is working on a five-race winning streak, including this wire-to-wire -wire score in the mile and an eighth Washington Park Handicap, beating Summer Squall by seven and a half lengths. Trainer Ernie Poulos knows when it comes to courage, his horse won't be found lacking. This horse has got a heart as big as his body. This horse, uh, uh, my assistant trainer, Charlie Bettis, he's done a wonderful job with him. He's been up with this horse here for about three weeks now. He's trained well here, he's breezed well. Summer Squall is a horse of promise who often disappoints. The 1990 Derby runner-up and Preakness winner has only one stakes win this year. That was in his last start, Keeneland's Fayette Handicap, where he took the lead after slow early fractions and held off unbridled by three links over a mile and an eighth. Now trainer Neil Howard is happy to have him back at Churchill Downs. I don't know if there is any kind of an edge in any kind of a Breeders' Cup race, but there again, it sure doesn't hurt that he's, that he's at home here. Festine has a chance at Horse of the Year. The Argentine bred has earned over $2 million in 1991, racing in varying conditions at six different tracks. She's raced on muddy tracks, and he's raced on tracks in New York and California, and um, it'll be a good race, you know, we're, we're real excited about it. His last win was one of his best. Closer to the pace than usual, he roared down the stretch to win the mile and a quarter Jockey Club Gold Cup by a length and a quarter. He'll have closing kick today. Then there is the War of the Roses, Strike the Gold and Unbridled, who returned to the downs for the first match of Kentucky Derby winners since Ferdinand and Ali Shiva in 1987. Last year belonged to Unbridled as he emerged from the rear of the pack to run down Summer's Fall, providing us with one of the Derby's most touching moments. Trainer Carl Nasker with then 92-year-old owner Francis Ginter. But Unbridled has been inconsistent as a four-year-old. I think the horse here proved he's fit. I'm ready to run. Uh, I'm confident in the horse. I'm ready to go with it. The 1991 Derby was the finest hour for Strike the Gold, who hasn't won since, and trainer Nick Zito. Who can blame him for wanting to relive it again and again? Another horse with a confirmed finishing kick. Strike the Gold has perked up upon returning to his not-so-old Kentucky home, setting up a great tactical race. I would say it should be a replica of the Derby and hopefully Strike the Gold will be first. I mean, it looks like the same type of race. A great cast for a one-act play, hoping for the same rave reviews awarded Unbridled and jockey Pat Day in the 1990 Classic. hoping to make history today to become the first back-to-back -back winner of the Breeders' Cup Classic. Here's the way the fans are uh, seeing their chances. 7-2 to two on Summer Squall, likewise on Unbridled. Two horses familiar to Churchill Downs fans. Black Tie Affair is also at 7-2, to two, so three horses held at 7-2 to two odds. Strike the gold is 4-1. to one. Pick a winner in this one? It's tough. Anybody could win the Classic. Blue light takes a refreshing look at musical chairs. I know what happened out there, and have you got an early diagnosis on Falago? He injured his right front ankle coming out of the turn. It's been splinted. He loaded well. He's back in his own stall, and he's being evaluated right now. Any idea how long before we'll know the condition? We'll try to get an update as soon as we can so that we can let everybody know. If we don't know, it takes a little bit to get x-rays. From the very first look, it doesn't look to be a life-threatening situation? Not initially. It looks like that he went in the splint well, he loaded well, and he's back in his own stall. Well, it sounds promising, and hopefully we'll have a positive attitude for you a little later on. Right now, let's go back to Tom Hammond. 
Well, Churchill Downs is not the only place that the wagering takes place on the Breeders' Cup. There are many simulcast sites, and here's the way uh, the other areas around the country feel about the horses in the Classic. Festine is 3-1 to one favorite at Aqueduct. At Santa Anita in California, they also like Festine at 3-1. to one. But Black Tie Affair is the 3-1 to one favorite at Greenwood up in Toronto. And out in Livingston, Wyoming, at Wyoming Downs, they look for the Derby winner, the three-year-old, Strike the Gold. Who is it? Five to two. Well, it's very fitting that we have a wide open race because this has been a wide open day. Prior to today, favorites have won almost 41% of Breeders' Cup races and 53% of the winners were three to one or less in the betting, but not today. It's been a day for the long shots. And there is Ron McAnally getting ready to give Eddie Delahousie a leg up on Festine, one of the stretch runners in this race. And John Veach, an interesting tactical race because there's early speed, there is tactical speed that you can use at any point of the race, and there are the late closers. Without a doubt, Tom, but what everybody must remember is that there are many ghosts of great horses that hover over the stretch here at Churchill Downs. It is long and it is deadly for a horse in front. They, they have to have a tremendous amount of stamina to hold on and as we've seen today these horses that come from behind with great with great strength seem to overcome the horses in front and it is also a, ho a racetrack that seems to favor horses that like the racing strip. We've seen so many great uh, horses that have run here say in the Kentucky Derby that have gone elsewhere and, and lived up to their press clippings and didn't come home in the derby as they should so uh, if a horse has run well here then he certainly deserves some sort of uh, backing well it's also a strong derby connection with the classic the last four winners have been kentucky derby winners here are the horses for the classic sponsored by mobile kudos several times francois boutin has been france's leading trainer but why kudos is here is really a mystery though lately he did have a group one win back in may but picked a tough spot for his first race on dirt Number two, Summer Squall, purchased from the Keeneland sales for $300,000. Summer Squall is owned by 28 individuals who invested in Cock Campbell's Dogwood Stable Classic Partnership. Summer Squall has earned $1.8 million, but the 1990 Preak this winter has only one stakes win this year, Keeneland's Fayette. Number three, Star of Gdansk. Owner Onrik de Fiatkowski was born in Poland, and most of his horses have Polish connections in their names. Star of Gdansk has had a fairly undistinguished career in Europe. Number four, Chief Honcho, trained by Bill Mott, who bought his first horse at age 16 for $320 and won some races in South Dakota. Chief Honcho is always close, but seldom wins. Number five, Fly So Free. A year ago, this colt was hot stuff. Winner of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, champion two-year-old and Kentucky Derby favorite. But as a three-year-old, he's been a cut below the best. He's owned by Broadway musical producer Thomas Volando. Number six, Festine. Burt Kennert purchased this horse in Argentina two years ago. Brought to the U.S. and turned over to Ron McAnally, Festine is Blossom. Runner-up to farm away in the American Championship Racing Series points and winner of almost $2.2 million, part of which goes to charity in Kennert's hometown of Tucson. Number seven is unbridled. This colt is far from consistent, but Carl Nasker seems to get him ready for the big ones. Owned by 93-year-old Francis Ginner, whose husband invented the pop-up toaster. Unbridled won the Derby and the Classic in 1990. Number eight, Black Tie Affair, has been a good horse in previous years, but maybe in 1991 has become a great horse. Who would have predicted after finishing eighth and third in the last two Breeders' Cup sprints that Black Tie Affair would become a world beater, already winning almost a million dollars this year and taking his last five in a row. Trained by 280-pound former football player Ernie Poulos, Black Tie Affair should go right to the front. Number nine, Twilight Agenda. Like Black Tie Affair, the question is, can this horse carry his speed over a mile and a quarter? He comes off a win in the Meadowlands Cup and could give Chris McCarron his third classic victory. Number 10, Strike the Gold. Things have definitely gone downhill for Strike the Gold since he wore the Derby Roses in May. He hasn't won a race and his owners have been squabbling. But he's back in familiar surroundings and trainer Nick Zito is again expecting a big charge down the Long Churchill stretch. And number 11, Marquetry, a horse that'll jump up and surprise you when you least expect it. He did it a couple of times in the American Championship Racing Series and could today. Pat Edry rode him in England and rides him here today. Greg McCarron, you were... Uh, 
an exercise rider pressed into service to gallop Festine earlier, away from your normal jockey duties. What can you tell us about Festine? Tom, I can tell you he's got a really efficient stride. It's very, very long, and yet his feet don't come off the ground very far. There's not a wasted motion in it, and this long stretch, like has been mentioned, will certainly suit, the, suit his style. Another horse I, I, I think there's watching is Marquetry. He's been reunited with Pat Ettery, who hasn't ridden him in about a year since he shipped to this country. And Bobby Franklin must think that the jockey connection has something to do with it. All right, there is a look at Marquetry. As the horses warm up in preparation for the world's richest race, the $3 million Breeders' Cup Classic. They'll race a mile and a quarter when we return to Churchill Downs. Welcome back to Sports Weekend Control in Toronto. I'm Brian. Your distance at Churchill Downs. They charge down that long stretch the first time, make their way down the backside, and then where a lot of fears and tears occur, the long home stretch at Churchill Downs to the wire, the same distance as the Derby, a mile and a quarter. Jenny Ornstein is with Cot Campbell, who heads the syndicate that owns Summer Squall. Jenny? Well, with two minutes to post to the Classic, Cot is watching Summer Squall warm up. What do you think? Well, he looks great. We're confident. The horse looks good. It's in the lap of the gods. This horse is versatile. He has either rallied or been the close to the pace. What's the strategy? The well, we're going to kind of, you know, Pat will play it like it opens up, and he'll uh, hopefully uh, lay right behind the speed. Uh, we don't want to have to uh, plump the pace. We want somebody to go up there with black tie fair. We don't want to be the ones, but if we have to, we will, and we can. All right, good luck to you with Summer Squall. Cock Campbell, let's go up to Tom Hammond, check out the odds on the Classic. All right, the race that could decide Horse of the Year. A lot of factors go into it. Summer Squall is 4-1. to one. Festine, 3-1. to one. Unbridled is at 4-1. to 7-2 on Black Tie Affair, and Strike the Gold is 5-1. to one. So the favorite, Festine, at 3-1 to one in an evenly matched field. Greg McCarron, as you watch them approach the starting gate, does anything catch your eye? Anyone uh, turning a hair untowardly out there? Anybody not warming up properly? Well, without sounding like a, a homeboy, I was just talking to my brother Chris, and, and he really likes his horse. He, he said he, the other night at Meadowlands, he galloped out strong as can be, and people have come to him and said there was a question whether he could get the mile and a quarter, and he doesn't think it's any question at all. He's, he's really excited about his horse right now. Chris McCarron rides Twilight Agenda, who did win at the Meadowlands, and does have some early speed, although Black Tie Affair would be the one we would expect to go to the front. You see Kudas getting the uh, hood put over his eyes as they will uh, lead him into the gate. Makes it easier to load them. Some of the horses, when they see that starting gate, John Beach don't want to go in. They shy away from it, and uh, not uncommon to see horses uh, blindfolded as they go in. No, it is not, uh, and it's a very easy and simple way uh, to, to, to load a horse that is, is a problem. It's, it's much easier than trying to manhandle them and physically putting them in. They relax when they can't see. Sometimes they'll turn them around one time so they lose a little bit of their orientation and then they'll walk right in. Uh, it really doesn't hurt them at all and it, it's, uh, it's an, Id an ideal way to do it. And if those uh, colors look familiar, they belong to Alan Paulson who already has won two Breeders' Cup races today. Worn this time by Freddie Head, the French jockey. And Kudas, not wanting to go in, finally gets a little assistance and still balks. Unbridled could make Breeders' Cup history if he wins the Classic. What a ride he got from Pat Day last year as they threaded their way through traffic. This time it's Craig Perrette on Unbridled, and Pat Day has opted for Summer Squall. Well, what they're doing here is they've, they've tried the, the, the hood on him, and he, he didn't like it the first time, so then they tried to, uh, what they call, ear him, grab a hold of his ear. That really doesn't hurt him too much. It just gets his attention, and then it gives the fellows that grab him from behind and try to push him in uh, an opportunity to not to be injured. Even but the blindfold, not No, working. apparently he doesn't care for the gate at all. They may have to take him out in front and try to back him in. Well, now they but get now him, they get him, steam and get him in there. They, they turned him one time, and it, uh, with a, uh, and it kind of disoriented him, and then he went. And there is Pat Day aboard Summer Squall entering the starting gate. Greg McCarron, any special strategy in a mile and a quarter race, one of the longer races American riders face? This really is such a long stretch, and you start right at the head of the stretch that there, you just leave the gate and you kind of fold up on your horse and, and hope not to get shuffled back early. And, and usually that's not the question. And we've only got 11 horses here. There shouldn't be any problems. But we're going a mile and a quarter with this long stretch. The biggest key is patience. Well, we saw Kudis uh, not displaying any patience, still uh, acting up a little bit in the starting gate in the inside post as we look at past winners of the Breeders' Cup Classic. Is he up? Wild again in that great wild finish. 
Proud Truth, trained by John Veach, Skywalker, Ferdinand, and the others, including Unbridled a year ago, trying to make it back-to-back. -back. Unbridled will be next in the gate under Craig Perrette. He's in, and let's go to Tom Durkin for the classic call. And it's post time for the Breeders' Cup Classic. This race has been won the last four years by Kentucky Derby winners, and there are two in the field today. Unbridled, who won the Classic last year, and Strike the Gold, who now moves into post position number 10. Final horse to load here for this eighth $3 million Classic will be Marquetry. Field standing poised in the starting gate. Kudas was a big rank earlier, but he's settled down now. Just one behind the gate, and that is Marquetry, ridden by Pat Pettery. Early speed here, perhaps coming from Black Tie Affair, Twilight Agenda, and three powerful stretch runners in unbridled festine and strike the gold. Can't stay here all day. Is he up now? Having some in the gate difficulty with Chief Hancho. Take him off. Or take him off. Of. Is he up at all? Chief Hancho in the starting gate and being attended to or by the off. assistant take starters. Being tailed in the gate. Put it back in again. He's backed up to the uh, back of the stall, and the assistant starters have now uh, freed him, and uh, Chief Honcho backs out of the starting gate momentarily. He will be reloaded into the starting gate, and will be ready to go right. for this classic race. Now Chief Honcho is back in, and Come still on, just one game. behind the gate. That is marquetry. Long run to that first turn here at Churchill Downs. Gate, and they are off in the Breeders' Cup Classic. And it is Black Tie Affair who comes out running for the lead. Star of Gdansk is there. Chief Honcho was pitched back in between horses. And Summer Squall, with that good tactical speed, maintains a forward position at the inside. And they pass beneath the Twin Spires for the first time as Black Tie Affair will lead the Classic field under the wire. Summer Squall under a firm hold there by Pat Day. Star of Gdansk is up close to the pace. And the Nets fly so free, racing three wide, Twilight Agenda four wide into the turn, long shot Kudas has settled in six toward the inside, Chipancho is moving along smoothly in seventh, and then it's Marquetry racing eighth position, he's about nine lengths from the front, and then farther back, the late running power of Strike the Gold, Unbridled, and Festine, they're all about 12 lengths from the front now, the Black Tie Affair is just cruising on an easy lead, a dawdling pace in the classic, 24 and 1 for the quarter, 48 and 2 fifth seconds for the half, and it is Black Tie Affair bounding along. Star of Gdansk is trying to run to him, but Black Tie Affair lets it out another notch. Twilight Adinja, third on the outside. Summer Squall is now back racing in fourth. He's down inside, and then it's Fly So Free. Chief Honcho's gearing up on the far outside, followed by Marquetry. Kudas has dropped out of it, and huge margins to be made up here by Unbridled Strike the Golden Festine. They are far behind. They're at least 15 lengths from the front, and now now, here comes Twilight Agenda to challenge Black Tie Affair as they approach the top of the stretch here at Churchill Downs. Fly So Free is poised in third position. Chief Honcho rallies on the outside. Marquetry is also right there. Summer Squall is still six lengths from the lead now. Unbridled is coming with his rally, but he's seven lengths from the front with a pair long to go. And Black Tie Affair grimly trying to hold on to the lead on the outside. Twilight Agenda, it'll be those two. Black Tie Affair on the inside. Twilight Black Tie Affair and a front-running masterpiece of race riding here by Jerry Bailey does it. And then it was Twilight Agenda. The time here for the 8th Classic was 2.02 and 4. Black Tie Affair, wire to wire in the Classic. Jerry Bailey went to the front. He slowed down the pace. He had enough left as Black Tie Affair wins his sixth consecutive race and maybe wins horse of the year we'll be back there in the classic over twilight agenda and unbridled and tom durkin jerry bailey rode a great race
Jerry Bailey wrote an absolute masterpiece. There's the eventual winner as he was all the way on the lead. Easy fractions here, 24 and 1, 48 and 2. And the late running horses here, unbridled, was the best of them, had no shot off that slow pace. In workmanlike fashion, as he has done all year, he's not a real glamour horse. Uh, he's out of Chicago. He went to Detroit, Jersey, Nebraska. None of those uh, highbrow places like Saratoga or Santa Anita. He's a bit like his hometown of Chicago. He's tough, he's honest, he's hardworking, and those blue-collar qualities have paid off. He's now a millionaire several times over. Well, a win for the blue-collar equine set, Black Tie Affair in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Part of the year, won those big New York stakes, four of them, but then passed the Classic and was beaten in the mile. Do you give it to Black Tie Affair, who ran an only one ACRS race, won at the Island, mostly didn't race in the top events, however, but was brilliant, winning six in a row, including the Classic. Do you give it to the two-year-old Arazi, who amazed onlookers here today? Do you give it to Dan Smartly, who didn't lose all year, won the Canadian Triple Crown and beat the boys? John Veach, it is a dilemma for the voters. It is a, a tremendous dilemma. I mean, it, it certainly might come down to a year where we have our champions by default in, in, in many divisions. Uh, certainly, Arazi, uh, you could give him uh, a lot of credit for what he did today. Of course, uh, he is running primarily in Europe, and a lot of people won't take that, you know, uh, and, of course, uh, Dan Smartly did do a tremendous job in Canada and came here and with a distaff, so it's, she's got a tremendous shot. But uh, the older horses, it it's really is a muddle. And here it is through the stretch. Twilight Agenda made a move on the outside, but Jerry Bailey had something left with Black Tie Affair. He had gone to the front but slowed down the fractions. Now he urges his horses on and gets home by a length over Twilight Agenda. Great ride by Jerry Bailey to slow it down and have plenty left. Well, the Notre Dame kickoff fast approaches from South Bend. You'll see the Irish taking on Navy later today. That's following our Breeders' Cup telecast. Dick Enberg and Bill Walsh, about 16 minutes from now, will kick it off. The midshipmen against the Fighting Irish from South Bend here on NBC. And the result now official in Black Tie Affair has become the eighth Breeders' Cup Classic winner and a day which has been unpredictable at best. Black Tie Affair goes wire to wire to take the world's richest race. Black Tie Affair is a horse by Ms. Walkie out of Hattab Girl by Al Hattab, bred in Ireland by Stephen Peskoff and owned by Jeffrey Sullivan. Trevor Denman now what with winning like rider Jerry Bailey. Out here. Everybody's going to be talking about this ride for years to come, Jerry. What did it feel like out there? It was pretty simple, to be honest with you. The tapes I watched of him, uh, he ran on the lead very relaxed. That's the way I did it. Nobody seemed to press him too much, which was to, to my benefit, and he had a lot left when I turned for home. Did you see Twilight Agenda, or did you hear him coming? Well, I didn't know who it was breathing on me turning for home. I realized it was him at the eighth pole, but it, it really didn't matter who it was. It was time to go, and we straightened out. Was it in the game plan? Here, oh, here's the finish. Let's take a look at what's going through your mind right here. Well, you know, the only thing, he switched right to his right lead, which he has a tendency not to do. But then he switched back to his left, you know, approaching the wire, and I was undecided whether to hit him left-handed or to stay with the right. But he was running well, so I stayed where I was. Great win, Jerry. Congratulations. Thanks, Let's go back to Tom Hammond. Big smile for Jerry Bailey. Black Tie Affair had been third in the 1990 Sprint, eighth in that same race in 89. Wins the Classic and pays $10. Twilight Agenda and Unbridled. Keeping move on the outside is coming toward the lead. Grand Girlfriend also kicks in. Queen is coming hard on the extreme outside now as the field comes down toward the final furlong. Brought to mind with a short lead. Dance Smartly is right there on the outside. Fit for a queen. Brave at the rail third. Here comes Versailles. Treaty was kicking in late, but it is Dance Smartly. She takes the lead under Pat Day's urging and pulls away here by two. It is Versailles Treaty, but it's too late and not enough. And it is Dance Smartly who strides under the line, undefeated this year, and the undisputed queen of racing on this continent. You saw a jubilant. Jockey Jerry Bailey gets his first Breeders' Cup win, wire to wire on Black Tie Affair, the only horse to win on the lead at the Breeders' Cup this afternoon. That exacta paid 146.60. Word from the stable area, Falago, injured early in one of the races, is okay. The x-rays are negative. Good news from the back stretch here at Churchill Downs. Let's go now to Bob Newmeyer with the presentation for the Breeders' Cup Classic.
This is a marvelous moment for the city with the big shoulders, Chicago, Illinois. The connections representing that great sports town to officially make the presentation. My pleasure to introduce to you, Alan E. Murray, the chairman of the Mobile Corporation. Alan? Thank you. On behalf of Mobile, I'm delighted to present this to you. Another great classic. Your horse isn't willing to let anybody pass him today. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> right. This is Jeffrey Sullivan. He owns a car dealership in Chicago. Three million dollars, the purse for the race that you just won. Well, it's, uh, it's terrific. It's just unbelievable. We, we thought we had a real good horse, and now today he proved it. And your trainer is a favorite among racing fans everywhere. Big Ernie Poulos, former star football player of the Continental League, linebacker, guard, been knocked around, horse criticized. Nobody had any respect for him. You showed him today, Ernie. Yeah, they have no respect. They've got it now. This horse was underrated and everything. Now they believe he's the horse I've been telling them right along. He is horse. He's all heart. They try to get him here. He pulled away again, didn't he? Should this be horse of the year, Ernie? You got to stand smartly. You've got a Razi. They're going to take some consideration. Should Black Tie Affair be horse of the year? I'd say absolutely. He should be horse of the year, right with them other good. Them are all other good horses too now. You know, I'm not knocking nobody. But I got the best one. All right, Ernie. Well said. Ernie Poulos. A lot of happy people in the city of Chicago tonight. They've got it all here in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Let's go back to Tom. All right, Bob. The Black Tie Affair was the best today in the Classic. As you look at the complete order of finish, Festine, who went off as the favorite, wound up sixth. Didn't have that customary late stretch run after the slow early fractures. Makes it tough on the come-from-behind horses. And a disappointing performance once again from Summer Squall. Now, Jenny Ornstein. Well, I was tremendously impressed today by Arazi. It's hard to give a Horse of the Year award to a two-year-old, but I've never seen a juvenile impress me the way that horse did today that he won in the juvenile race. We'll see what happens. Dan Smartly looks strong as well, but my vote goes to Arazi. Trevor, what do you say? Well, it's just so tough. You go early in the year and go farm away, Feston. In excess in the middle of the year was right there as well. He's got to be a major contender. The two-year-old Arazi, I'll go with a guy who came well right at the end. Black tie affair. Breeders' Cup Day is supposed to decide championship. I would go Black Tie Affair, Horse of the Year. Dan? Well, many deserving candidates, but in a year of ambiguity, I say Arazi, the most transcendent performance by a thoroughbred I've seen since Secretariat was a three-year-old. Well, John Veach, uh, we'll have to get your vote now. Certainly, Arazi's performance was amazing. It was amazing. It was a, a tremendous accomplishment for a horse as green as he was to come and do what he did, uh, going the, actually turning the wrong way for him, and he was amazing to me. He's my choice. All right, Bob Newmeyer. All right, Tom. All right, Tom, thank you very much. With Greg McCarron and Tom Durkin, who made those great calls, racing's a wonderful game. This is a sport for every man, for people like Ernie Poulos and Alan Paulson, for people like Pat Valenzuela. Horse of the year, do you have a pick? Arazi, like Secretary did. I'm going to go with Black Tie Affair, Greg. I'm with you, Bob, Black Tie Affair. Two votes for Black Tie. Let's go back to Tom. All right, Bob, and my uh, vote two to Arazi, the most brilliant performer on an unpredictable day. Breeders' Cup 8 from Churchill Downs. As we leave NBC, I'm Brian Williams at Sports Weekend Control in Toronto. I'll tell you, Dan Smartley may not be their pick for Horse of the Year. She is without question North American Filly of the Year. Let me put it into perspective for you. Canadian horses prior to today, and the Breeders' Cup began back in 1984, were 0 for 18 in the Breeders'. She wins today on the track where her grandfather, Northern Dancer, won the Kentucky Derby in 1964. Also were Sonny's Halo, Pud Foster's horse, ridden by... Eddie De La Huse won the Derby in 1983, so certainly one of the three biggest moments in the history of Canadian thoroughbred racing. We've shown you the finish. We're still going to hear from Jim Bannon during the next 90 minutes. We'll hear from Ernie Samuel and Jim Day as we satellite up those special reports. But right now, we have queued up for you a different look at the finish of the distaff today. Dan Smartly making Canadian racing history. You'll see a jubilant owner, Ernie Samuel. Queen Brave at the rail third. Here comes Versailles. Trini was kicking in late, but it is Dance Smartly. She takes the lead under Pat Day's urging and pulls away here by two. It is Versailles Trini, but it's too late and not enough. And it is Dance Smartly who strides under the line, undefeated this year, and the undisputed queen of racing on this continent. 
She really is. I was talking with veteran broadcaster Pat Marston this afternoon. As he says, as he said, it almost brings tears to your eye. It really is a special moment for Canadian thoroughbred racing, a special moment for a very classy outfit from Samson Farm, Ernie Samuel, Jim Day, Jockey Pat Day, who came in from the United States to ride Dan Smartly in the Canadian Triple Crown and the Molson Million. Again, we have the National Horse Show coming up in just a minute. More reports from Churchill Downs and Louisville. Let me wrap up the Canadian Day again for those of you just joining us. Key Spirit, written by Mickey Walls, owned by Toronto's Michael Singh, was last in the sprint but suffered a wrenched ankle. It is not believed to be serious. Dan Smartly with Pat Day winning the distaff. Wilderness Song, Francine Villeneuve up for Ernie Samuel, the other part of that favored entry running in the number seven position in the distaff. Sky Classic, a disappointing fourth in the $2 million turf race. Again, we're going to take... And hello again, everyone. I'm Chris.